Okay, a anything you want to chat about? Anything you want to bring up? Anything you want to say? How are you doing, Jaws? Uh, I, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine, Green. I want to say thank you first for having me on. Of course, it's the uh, first time that I'm here. Yeah, it is. It's fun. It's fun inviting new people. Just random people I meet over the internet, and we're going to talk about stuff. Yeah, we are going to talk about Attack on Titan. Yes. So, I will begin. I am here with Jaws, and we're going to talk about Attack on Titan. Going to do a little retrospective, kind of talking about the ending, but that implies we're talking about the whole thing as well. Jaws, do you want to take a few seconds to introduce yourself real quick? Yes, uh, hello everyone. I'm Jaws, and uh, I spend at least some of my time writing novels, none of which are quite finished, so they're also not published, uh, published yet, and otherwise I consume basically any kind of narrative in any kind of media, be it anime, be it um, books, novels, TV shows, or anything else. Uh, there is basically no real reason to follow me on Twitter or anywhere else because I hardly do post anything other than some screenshots or some very short reviews of stuff I have finished. And that's pretty much it for my introduction. Hooray! All right. With those credentials under our belt and me being me, I feel very qualified to talk about Attack on Titan. Attack on Titan is a weird show for me. It was kind of a, it was an absolute contemporary of my anime career, you could say. It st I started watching it before I got really into anime, and it ended after I kind of pulled back a bit. So it was there for the entire thrust of me defining my life through anime. Okay. Yeah, it's strange how, it is, how it was like right in the middle for you in, in terms of your career. Uh, for me, it... Um... It was also a little bit uh, a little bit weird. Like I was not aware of the existence of the manga at all when when it uh, came out in like two thousand nine, I think. Uh, and then uh, I became aware of the anime when it came out, but I completely ignored it for like a year or more. And um, I started watching it, but I also then dropped it like seven episodes in, and then didn't watch it for another like two years. <laughs> Wait, you Before dropped I, it right when it got good? I'm not sure if it was episode 7 or episode 9 or something. Um, no, actually, it was a little bit further even. Uh, a little bit sooner, I mean. Okay, I'm, I'm mixing things up a little bit. <laughs> I think I should start with um, the, the scene there uh, where Aaron loses like his arm and his leg. I was What I felt in that moment was pretty much like in the meme with the guy who stands at the window and says... Yes. Ah, yes. Because oh, the I thought, we, yeah, exactly. Because I thought, um, I thought we were going to have a bait and switch in terms of protagonist, and I was kind of looking forward to this. But this is not what happened. Instead, we kind of got the generic main character gets monstrous power up and regenerates all their limbs, kind of stuff. And at that moment, I already thought, oh no, not this shit again. But I didn't drop it yet. Uh, I then dropped it after the episode in which they are standing around in the smoke of Eren's decomposing Titan form after they have been fired at with the cannon. And it's this entire episode of them talking in the smoke, and it has such a crappy pacing <laughs> that I couldn't take it after this one. I, I don't get into Twitter arguments or in any other arguments, like maybe once or twice a year. But I got into an argument about this one scene. <laughs> uh, that was a thing about Attack on Titan. For all of Attack on Titan's virtues, no one can ever possibly defend the production decisions of that first season. You just can't do it. I think mostly it's fine. It's more like it has some moments that don't work. To an like extent, that. it was unavoidable because it was pretty obvious that the big turning point of the first chunk of the show had to be the Annie fight with Annie escaping, or I guess escaping into herself by becoming a chrysalis, but that is part of the problem with the manga, is the manga had really defined sections where there are sudden big reveals, where you almost are obliged to build the anime around it. And in the yeah. case of the first season, it created episodes where literally there was maybe seven minutes of stuff happening, and they just had to stretch it out. Yeah. The weird speech Armin gives about giving his heart to the people while Aaron is a skeleton, that yes. might be the worst example. 
One of the most frustrating for me was the episode where they graduate and have to pick which branch of the military to go in. Oh, that one I actually like. I like that conceptually, but so much, so little happens. And the worst part is there's almost no animation. And then they eventually yeah. hit a point where people are just walking. And that oh, yeah, was somehow that too much. They that just drew like, a, a freeze yeah. frame ghost image and played the sound of people stepping over it. Yeah, that one looks like shit. Yeah, but the, 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 that episode uh, I liked, like in terms of content and what it was saying. Yeah, I think Attack on Titan did get better in terms of, against all logic, it spun out of control and acquired so much time and attention and money that as it went along, they had to do stuff like that less. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I think in like um, season three, part one, I think there were also some parts that were not quite uh, the same standard. But you were talking about the reveal that Eren is a Titan shifter. That yes. might be one of the most controversial moments in anime in the last 10 years. Really? And uh, it's up there. Well, I think most people thought it was cool, but the people who had a problem with it were so enraged and pissed off at the show that it created a really vocal controversy, even if even if normie-ish fans did like it. And it was one of those situations where if you've seen a lot of anime, you know where it's going to go. If you've only yeah. seen a few anime, it's, oh my god, the hero is a monster too? This is the crate. I've never seen this. Yeah, that, that was exactly the, the problem for me that I uh, had seen this well, trope, whatever you want to call it, stereotype, uh, so many times. And I thought, no, I thought we finally had some, some grounded, gritty military stuff um, where there are just humans fighting monsters. And now we have this kind of transformation stuff again. And it means if one person transforms, it means others do too. Eren was almost the 2010s version of Sasuke in that regard. Yeah. Where yeah. Sasuke was a bizarre, extremely divisive character where... A lot of people do like him, but there's a big wedge, and the more experienced you are as a viewer, the more likely you are to have a big problem with him. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, most people, when they start with anime, they start with uh, Naruto, and in, in, uh, in that case, they probably don't have much of a problem with uh, Sasuke. Exactly. I try to remember what, like, my, what, what I thought about it. I mean, uh, Naruto was the first anime I watched. I don't think I had like a big problem with him, but I also didn't think like he was the best or coolest thing ever, like somewhere in the middle. Well, the big problem with Sasuke was always the intensity of his emotion compared to his motivations and how unclear yeah. they could be. Where there yeah. are several points in the show where Sasuke completely does a 180 on the target of his rage, but he always has the rage. Yeah, there's a, this strange scene where he breaks uh, like the, the one sound ninja's arms. And uh, it's made to to look really cool and edgy and stuff. And yeah, it kind of is, actually. But it's still completely out of character for him. Well, if you were 13 in America at the time, that was sick as fuck. And it was. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Sasuke was so controversial because it never... Because it was obvious that him being the edgelord came before his reasons for doing it, at least part of the time. Yeah. And Aaron, I will give Aaron credit... Eren is a complex protagonist compared to what you would expect. Yes, he is actually very well written. I do and find him extremely frustrating. In, in what terms? In terms of the more it goes along, it eventually reaches a point where I don't really understand why Eren is doing this anymore. Okay. Or, or, or near the end of the show, I almost feel like Eren becomes so complicated that he starts losing agency, where it yes. becomes so hard to understand what he's doing. He definitely starts losing agency. I mean, it might actually be a, a theme with him because like his whole drive for freedom and then in the end he can basically be considered the, the one character who is uh, trapped the most and who has the least agency at the end because he's trapped by the whole memory paths kind of thing. The future's already decided stuff. Jaws, are you implying that accepting total subjugation as a human being is the ultimate path to spiritual freedom what type of <laughs> political establishment might you be endorsing right now sir uh i'm not sure how you got to uh, that that assumption well, well aaron sought freedom and he ended up a slave maybe if you follow the people above you in the social hierarchy absolutely you'll attain perfect freedom in the end 
okay. <laughs> I'm 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 making a joking transition yes. into the fascist subtext of the at least the aesthetic of the show. Okay, so we're we're getting into that uh, small can of worms already. Are you a can of worms half uh, half full or half empty kind of guy? I like to think I am the worms. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So let's uh, talk about that. I mean, there have been so many criticisms leveled against Attack on Titan for their portrayal in, in this fascist sense. But uh, I think if one basically watches the whole thing and follows along, then um, it is not endorsing fascism. In my opinion, it doesn't. I wouldn't say so either. In a way, it's almost endorsing futility. Yeah, it's almost yeah, it's, saying that politics is going to fuck you no matter what you do, so just shrug your way through it. Yeah. like I think that... I'm not sure if it's the main theme, but one of the main themes of um, Attack on Titan is the inherent uh, conflict and violence in all of life, not just human life. I mean, there's like this whole scene with uh, Mikasa where she is like a child and observing like uh, insects killing each other and stuff like that, where she noticed this, uh, this for the first time. And I think ultimately uh, that's one of the things that um, Isayama wants to say in Attack on Titan, that conflict will always be there. And um, Historia mentions it in her letter in the last chapter. Basically, she quotes Aaron and says that basically as long as there are people, there will be conflict. I would say that's true. I'm not entirely sure what Isayama was trying to tell us with this. It just seems like a very long, <laughs> it seems like a very long path to get there. Yeah, especially in, in the way that the Tekken Titan is built up. It feels like it's supposed to have a a definite conclusion, but then it doesn't. Like, in the end, uh, Eldia gets bombed to the fucking ground, and uh, basically the whole cycle starts over again, so as it is implied, even with the Titans. Like, the, the, the implication of the last chapter with the basically the Titan tree that we have seen in this flashback, um, which now seems to have sprouted from Aaron's severed head, which is buried on this hill, uh, and this boy stumbling upon it. It pretty much implies that the whole fucking thing is just going to start again. I understand that Mikasa was trying to be sentimental. They really should have thrown that into the ocean. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, that probably also wouldn't have worked. I mean, the, the thing, like the weird centipede thing, uh, as far as I remember, is a sea creature. Or in, in reality, it had been a sea creature. It's a prehistoric creature. They should have had Zeke throw it into space. It should have been, like, burned. But it even survived, like, the explosion of um, Armin's uh, colossal titan. So that thing was almost indestructible. There but, could be a yeah, sequel had... where they throw it on the moon... And it starts yeah. creating moon titans. Yes. They could throw it all the way to Titan, the moon of, is it Jupiter? Um, I don't know. Oh my I god, that know. was the name of the show the whole time. Yeah. Um, by the way, the name of the, of, the, of the show, you should have started with saying that the, uh, I almost said the German title. The English title is wrong, and that we've basically been trolled for years. It's well, it kind of it kind of makes sense in terms of attack on Titan. It's like, oh, Aaron is the attack Titan, so it's like attack on Titan, like you're cheering it. But that's what he is. Does that kind of that, make sense? That's, I mean, that's kind of how how it was interpreted at first. But then we get the the late chapter where Hanji says uh, the same the same thing, and she uses the exact same words like uh, Shinjaki no Kyojin when she refers to Aaron's attack Titan. And theoretically, that would mean that the, the title for the show should have been Attack Titan. And I think Isayama meant this, that he did not mean the title to mean Attack on Titan, but Attack Titan. And I don't know why um, it was left with Attack on Titan, in, at least in English. I don't know if um, the Japanese speakers, when, when they say it in their own language, if they basically are saying Attack on Titan or if they are saying Attack Titan. Because it seems well, to be the same I will, thing. I will use my extremely meager knowledge of Japanese to say the syllable no is a way of just attributing modification. Where if you say dog, no food, it might mean food made out of dogs or it might mean 
food made for dogs. It's just yes. the first word modifies the second in an abstract way. Yeah, so there might like, not be a literal translation that doesn't require interpretation. I mean, yeah, Japanese is a context-based language, so all this miscommunication happens all the time. It would be kind of like saying Titan is what we're talking about, and it is modified by the concept of attack. Yes. So there's no real way of doing that without knowing what they're talking about. But I will say silly translation errors are almost a tra tradition with manga at this point. Yeah. I was like thinking about the uh, Hoshino Samidare, which has like three titles, like the, the English title uh, Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer, which has nothing to do with the original title, but it makes sense in context. Uh, but there also seem to be two Japanese titles, the one in Hoshino Samidare, I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, and the other one is Wakusai no Samidare. And Hoshi means star, and I think Wakusai means planet, so I think... The, Those mean uh, nothing of anything. Sure. Yeah, I think Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer was better. Really? Okay. Well, no, it's just a good name. I mean, it, no, I mean, it makes I, I sense like the in name. context. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, one thing I, I want to talk about, which uh, I thought about in the last couple of days, um, because I, as a, as someone who writes, I look at this from <laughs> from a writer's perspective, and one thing that I noticed in in the early parts of Attack on Titan is um, how the the nobles and the people in power, not necessarily much of the military, but mostly the nobles, are written in such a way that they are um, yeah, portrayed as completely incompetent and stupid and cowardly. And uh, it's not nuanced at all in this case. And this is a little bit strange when you compare it to the extremely nuanced and good character writing that is found uh, anywhere else in Attack on Titan. It's like, I mean, it's pretty obvious that uh, Isayama intended exactly this this view on uh, the current nobility, on the, the king, uh, the royal family, and so on. But I find it kind of infuriating when uh, you have this scene where um, this rich merchant, I forgot his name, uh, is trying to evacuate like his goods through this gate, and uh, his, his cart is basically too big for this uh, gate. And... Uh, he can see this, he can see it doesn't fit, and still he tries to get it through this uh, gate, and it's just something that's stupid. Like, a person wouldn't act like this. No, that was a really bad example. I will say, I think the most, the worst case of that might be Pixisu! Pixisu! Uh, what, what was the exact... Ah, um, oh, damn it. Uh, do you remember when Pi <laughs> do you remember when they're trying to get Pixis and he's in a castle out in a field somewhere? Yes, yes. And the fat noble eating candy is crawling on the ground, begging him to stay in the castle and protect him specifically. Oh wow, I I forgot that it got this this messed up. Like I remember they were like playing chess and Pixis let the guy win and uh, then he's called away. I didn't even remember that uh, the the other guy uh, begged him to to stay. That became a big meme uh, when the first season was blowing up. There were a bunch of animations of the fat guy yelling Pixisu as Pixis <laughs> walked away. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, okay, that's, yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about. Uh, I completely understand your point here. I think one aspect of Attack on Titan that that does play into is there's a big ongoing arc in Attack on Titan of lost innocence and appearances not matching up to reality. Yeah, that definitely where I think Attack on Titan kind of follows a pattern. This is something I want to talk about later, but the whole arc of Attack on Titan, at least its political progress, it almost follows the progress that a human being goes through in its understanding of politics if it continues advancing. Yeah. Where Attack on Titan, it starts in a place of total innocence. Then it goes to a point of innocence, but you understand there are people out to hurt you. Then it's a totally naive, young child, teenager view of the world where, oh my god, there are these monsters that are attacking us for no reason. We're in a struggle for our life. They're evil. Let's fuck them up. Then it progresses into cynicism where you realize, oh wow, our ostensible enemies are controlled by higher forces. And then it eventually collapses in the end stage, which is, okay, yeah, everything's a conspiracy, but the conspiracy is really dissatisfying where the conspirators are yeah. real. It's just nothing is to be gained by attacking them. It's just life sucks. Yeah. 
And I think the nobles being incompetent does make sense because it sets up the reveal. The nobles aren't really in control. The nobles are the formal leaders, but the real power structure is this underground parallel reality that the nobles have almost nothing to do with, or they're really just there to disguise. Yeah, sure. It just comes off as uh, lazy writing, but uh, no. I believe that. It's hard to judge anything in Attack on Titan because you never know. Was Isayama being incompetent because he was inexperienced or was he actually planning on doing something smart later? I, I think he did this on purpose. Like he, I mean, you can see this with the, the well written other characters even around the same time that he specifically wanted to portray them as such. But yeah, it, it's, he's, he goes a little bit overboard with it. Yeah, he does. And he makes the hierarchy within the walls so ineffective and silly that it's almost it's almost hard to believe that anyone would buy it at all. Yeah, probably in, in this case, if one thinks logically about it, it probably has to do with like the, the whole control of information and the whole memory reset power and stuff like this. And maybe that kind of serves to explain why the whole thing can function. Yeah, it does. And it's a funny situation where when you view it from the inside, it's inscrutable and extremely confusing and it feels nefarious and convoluted. But then when you get into the later stages of the show, you look back on it and you're just, oh, okay, there were only four or five people in the entire island who had any fucking clue what was going on. Yeah. Everyone else was just passively being battered around by a power structure. Once the walls fall down and we see the larger conflict, it's just, oh, okay, that was that was silly. People were almost better off just not questioning what reality was and just fighting. Because once yeah. you have the advantage to see the whole picture, you realize, oh, the, the conspiracy of the walls was a very petty matter in the scheme of things. It was just yeah. the actual elites just didn't tell us. I mean, uh, this comes up in what you just said with um, with Aaron at the end of the, the third season where, he, where they are all at the ocean and he points across the ocean and basically asks if we kill our enemy back there, are we free then? Like... Uh, I guess not. Because it, it just keeps going. Or for, for Aaron, it just kept going. Like, every, every step on the way was supposed to be the last one and uh, it just keeps going. Yeah, no, he never... No true freedom. He, his only freedom is becoming a bird at the end. I find this also like a little bit too, uh, too cliche. I found it hilarious. Okay, I didn't find <laughs> it hilarious. It wasn't, it wasn't okay. either good nor bad enough to be hilarious. I, I will say about Attack on Titan, as it went on, the final arc of Attack on Titan, it was a strange pattern because I saw Attack on Titan as going down in quality as yes. it as it suffered from scope creep complexity addiction got farther and farther removed from what the origins of the story were but then as they got into the conflict with the people on the other continents and the intrigue started heating up again and you realize oh wow Aaron's going dark on us shit's about to get real things started picking up again it felt like it was getting interesting again but then the final conflict just went so fucking long and got so complicated it kind of lost me towards the end again. Yeah, for me, this may sound a little bit strange, but for me, the most interesting parts about the Tekken Titan were never about the Titans or the, them fighting the Titans. It was always the um, conflict between the humans and the, the political stuff in it. And when we had um, the, the start of the rumbling uh, at the beginning of the last arc, basically, I kind of immediately understood oh no, now comes all the stuff in a way that I'm not going to like as much as uh, everything that came before it. Like It kind of put the, the more supernatural stuff in the center from that point onward, and that kept going for, for large portions of time. Or more precisely, the closer we got to the end, the more it got intensified. Like The, the final fight, basically, with all the different uh, titans that pop up and the uh, there was never what I what I enjoyed that much about Attack on Titan. The frustration with the Titans is eventually the Titans get so big that the Titan battles stop feeling like Titan battles. Yeah, that as well. Eren's final Titan forms become so big compared to the normal Titans that it almost reverts back to it's like they're fighting Titans, but as Titans. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And my big frustration with Eren towards the end is 
Attack on Titan felt like it was pulling towards a really strong ending when it felt like, okay, Eren has lost it. His berserker rage has finally caused him to transform into a new personality. He's not the same kid he was in the beginning. Or alternatively, he is that kid just finally letting his base instincts run wild. He's and, going and fucking point? nuts. He's going to stop the. When you realize Eren plans on exterminating all of humanity except okay, the people okay. he knows. Okay. It's like, yes. okay, that moment feels big because it's the intensity of Eren's decisions. But the way it wraps up, it downplays Aaron's worldview and his decisions more and more until yeah. by the end, it's almost it's almost like you're watching water trickle down a pile of rocks. It's just the physical play out of a predetermined set of forces. Yes. Yeah, very much like this. I was going to say something. Uh, hang on. Uh, while you're thinking of that, I need to take like five minutes real quick. I'll be right back. Yeah, sure. Of course. Cool. I'll be right back. All right, Jaws, I'm back. Are you there? Yes. Welcome back. All right, what yeah. were you thinking about? What do you want to talk about? Yeah, um, during the last chapter, there's like one thing that is basically com uh, complete bullshit because Aaron claims in his conversation with uh, Armin that um, 80% of all of humanity have been exterminated by the rumbling and that makes absolutely no sense at all. Oh, I, I mean, get it, because no one but the Eldians is actually human. <laughs> no, um... I mean, the rumbling lasts for, I don't know, 24 hours, maybe a bit more than that. I'm not entirely sure. But um, uh, first off, uh, the, the world of Attack on Titan is basically just the the, the human world, um, like our world. Uh, but with the poles flipped, we see this on a map. We can see this. And uh, pa uh, Paradis is located on Madagascar, which means Liberio is uh, located in what would be in our world, uh, Northern Africa. And in their world, basically, Southern Africa. And if you were to, to map this out on, on yeah, well, on a map, um, how far the, the rumbling titans would have gotten to anywhere else in civilization in that uh, amount of time, they would have not gotten far. Like, it's completely impossible that they would be able to exterminate 80% of all of humanity in that time frame. It makes absolutely no sense. Okay, I mean, I'll say the rumbling... I don't know if you're supposed to take it literally or it's a necessary cheat because to me, every aspect of the rumbling felt kind of silly. Yes. Where they're just going to step on people. They're not even paint. They're not even looking down to make sure they get them. They're just kind of shuffling forward. Just run between their toes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Most people would still run away, but uh, yeah, it is silly. And, uh, I mean, yeah, that was the moment where I, I realized that, um, that uh, the final parts were not going to be as good, in my opinion, as the parts that came before. We are like uh, very adamant on, on harping on the bad parts of Attack on Titan. We should actually start talking about some good parts. <laughs> uh, yeah, we could. Okay, good part. The ending. Oh, wait, no. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not the ending. No, I but, will um, say that I will lead with this. Isayama, in terms of having a fleshed out aesthetic that has a very broad appeal and a lot of hype to it, he fucking nailed it with the uniforms, the German houses, the 3D oh. maneuvering gear, the, the yeah. Titans. In terms of having an aesthetic to the world and a world with a unique feel to it, he absolutely nailed that and that carried him through the entire process. It is very nice and stylized, yeah. And uh, it works. It definitely, uh, definitely works. Um... Like, for me, the, the best parts of Attack on Titan are the character writing and uh, the political intrigue and stuff like this. Like, the, the moment, um, as I said, I, I dropped Attack on Titan after this um, the whole smoke conversation episode and uh, then didn't pick it up for like two years. But uh, when I then um, kept watching, uh, the part where I started to feel like, okay, I believe this uh, can go somewhere interesting, was um, when the captured titans were um, killed and uh, Erwin just uh, puts his hand on uh, Aaron's shoulder and just asks, who do you think the real enemy is? And uh, that was pretty much the moment where I thought, okay, yeah, this is going to get interesting. Um, I totally understand that. With Attack on Titan, I always had a hard time totally buying into the intrigue because a little part of me was thinking it's going to be dissatisfying once you learn. That that often happens with like 
many anime or doesn't have to be anime, any narrative in which a, a conspiracy or uh, a mystique rather uh, is presented. That happens quite often, but I think in Attack on Titan it worked extremely well. Like uh, it, it paid off extremely well with, with the, the whole basement re uh, reveal and that was excellent. Like Isayama has managed to structure and um, present Uh, his his ideas and concept uh, and his world so well from the beginning and uh, I think that's one of the things that's really admirable about what he's done with Attack on Titan. I will give ECM a lot of credit. It's not quite at the level of one, but in terms of someone pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and creating an empire out of just nothing, there are very few artists that you can point to that have done what he did. He had a very simple idea and a very limited degree of skill, and he managed to build a huge, colossal world that people all over the world love. I mean, in, in terms of the manga, especially in the beginning, the art really is not great. And even in, in the later parts, it's not what carries um, the manga. It's uh, the story and the characters and the concepts. And yeah, Isayama would probably be a better writer than he would be a, a, a mangaka. But yeah, he still, he still succeeds as a mangaka. It works. If you look at the manga, the shoddiness of the early sections, it's almost impossible to believe. Where it doesn't even have the charm of something like the original One Punch Man, where there's a real sincerity and goofiness to the line work. His work is just bad, especially in terms of he doesn't know how to draw panels. He doesn't know how to lay things out very well. He has very weak wispy lines they almost look like chicken scratch like he's pecking the pages <laughs> in places uh, all the shit that you yell at beginning artists when they're starting out over their shoulder telling them don't do that have confident lines have a strong <laughs> sense of three-dimensional space he did none of that one of my favorite aspects of tack on titan is the manga artist was paid a hundred million dollars to teach himself how to draw That's so fucking hilarious where he became a, he became one of the biggest manga artists in the world, then learned how to draw and he made bank doing it. And that's fucking amazing that he pulled that off. Yeah, that, it, it actually is. Now he can go into his next series and he actually knows how to draw this time as a world famous yeah. artist. I wonder if he is going to do something else. I don't know if he has said anything. Uh, he is... He's greenlit enough spinoffs at this point. It wouldn't surprise me if he milked Attack on Titan for another 15 years. Uh, I, I don't I would hope, know, but he could. I would hope that he does not do anything Attack on Titan related. No. I, I did look at one of the spinoffs a little bit, and it's hilarious because it's about Titans before the invention of the 3D maneuvering gear. Yeah. So if a Titan gets over the walls, even if it's oh, a little right, one, you're yeah. just fucked. Yeah. Right, I, I think it's, I've heard about this one. It's just hundreds of people have to chase it with spears and horses until they get lucky. Yeah. I think actually that would be maybe not more interesting, but still very interesting because that would be the more realistic, more grounded version of the, yeah, of the fight against Titans. Like without Titan yes. shifters, where it's just people getting basically destroyed by Titans. You said the things about Attack on Titan that were good. The political intrigue, for me, the political intrigue waxed and waned because sometimes the reveals would be clever, sometimes it's not, sometimes it was complexity for the sake of complexity, sometimes it made things more simple. You also mentioned the characters. I think there yes. are a few standout characters that are just awesome. Yeah. Aaron, absolutely. I don't I don't love Aaron. Aaron works for what he is. He has interesting aspects. I don't adore him. There are a few characters that are great. Rainier is fucking yes. awesome. Uh, Reiner is, um, yeah. Reiner, right. Thank God we have a German man here yeah, to tell me German how to pronounce the, the words. Yeah, yeah, that was not planned, by the way, unless you planned it. I did not. Um, I did not plan this. Uh, yeah, uh, Reiner is uh, one of the best Britain characters in the show by far. And his, um, his little backstory, I'm not sure if you can call it an arc, but uh, when they show his backstory in, in the Mali arc and his conversation with uh, Aaron in... in Well, I'm not sure if you could call it a basement. His conversation with Aaron before Aaron goes or um, destroys all of the barrier, basically. It's so great. It's one of the best moments in all of Attack on Titan. Wait, say his name again real quick. Reiner. Reiner. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> okay, hold on. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah. cutting that out so I look smart. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> 
Reiner manages to be beautifully tragic in the end, where in the beginning, yeah. he seems like the dumb jock, like a really cool dude, yeah. but not the hero of the story. He's the big guy. He's the tough guy that backs up the hero when the hero stumbles. Yeah, like the, and the, that's, um, that's, like the rock. The solid like rock like, like Dwayne that. Johnson? or <laughs> No, I, um, I was trying to... Um... Ah, uh, to to say um, to oh, say, it's a metaphor. say the saying, yeah, like a metaphor. The, the rock in uh, against the flood or something like this. I, I don't know how it is said in English. He, he is the rock that he can build his house upon, as opposed to the sand. That's that's another version of this, yes. Which is Armin. Armin. That God damn it! No, I'm, no, I'm, it's correct. I'm, like uh, no, I'm, I was uh, I was just saying Armin in uh, because. We switched from uh, from uh, Reiner to Armin, so I was confused. That was a bad joke. Ignore that. But they pull so much depth out of Reiner's character as it goes along. Yes. Where you eventually see him being conflicted and insane. It's obvious that he is suffering way more guilt than anyone else over what they're doing and being an infiltrator. Yeah, yeah I which, mean, it breaks them, kind of. Which, I don't know if that makes him a good person, per se, but it does add emotional complexity where you know that Reiner does care about being a good person, even if he knows he's not. Yeah. I mean, he... he I don't think that he wanted to do anything of the stuff he did, but he did anyway. But, yeah, because because of this uh, discrepancy between what he is and what he wants and what he does, uh, he is, suffers horribly. Yeah, he's probably the biggest victim in the whole show. Uh, I think that's Zeke, but um, Zeke Reiner is probably second. Yeah, Zeke Zeke is up there. I think Zeke is uh, the biggest victim, and then it's Reiner. And Reiner, it keeps adding layers of depth and tragedy to it, where you eventually learn that Reiner was a lot like Armin when he was yes. young. He was a sensitive, sweet kid that just wanted to help his friends, and then he yeah. had to be the big, tough guy to get everyone through the conflict. And then he that's went so, insane because he's so secretly tragic. the kindest character, but he's also the most brutal in terms of his behavior. And it drives him fucking mad. It's it's so tragic when he basically decides to... Uh, yeah, when he basically decides that he's going to replace the guy who died for him and his whole personality, and he basically stops being the kind of person he would have been otherwise. And he just takes on this kind of protector role which is not him at all. He is a fake, basically, from that point on. And uh, we see exactly what happens when you play a character that you are not, how that uh, affects you. Reiner is inauthentic in the sweetest, most genuine way. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, actually, yes, yeah, it's genuine. Yeah. Where his life consists of mimicking other people who he looks up to and thinks would be able to solve the problem and then making things worse. <laughs> yeah pretty much ah uh, yeah and by the end i love how reiner gets the <laughs> it's it's so fun you've seen full metal jacket right yes reiner begins to get the private pile scene where he's sitting yes. in the bathroom with the gun in his mouth yes. <laughs> while outwardly he's being the cool older brother to all the younger titan shifters who see him as a hero and think he's gonna lead them through so they're mimicking him and he's mimicking imaginary people and hit the real him is him sitting on the toilet with the rifle butt i think he's just sitting on the chair but uh, yeah okay he's, sitting it, on the chair damn it i fucking misremember didn't i no well in 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 full metal jacket he sits on the toilet okay it still kind of works yeah it's the same thing except of course ryan gets interrupted yeah, he gets... Well, I mean, Private Pile gets interrupted, too. He just shoots the guy who interrupted him. Yeah, sure. Right. He had he had follow-through, unlike Reiner. <laughs> this is why we lost Vietnam. Yeah, because pe uh, people like that. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just talking. But Reiner... Yeah. yeah, but Reiner is just a collapsing series of masks that he breaks out to paint on the situation, while the real person is a crying, injured child who just wants everything to end. Yes. Yeah, and it works. It works really, really well. It's hilarious that when he is around Gabby again, the little lolly Titan sidekick who's going to take over the Titan power, he just gets mogged by this child who is aggressive and mean and has a warrior spirit in a way that he never really could. Yeah. And he's getting overshadowed by his little kid sister cousin person while he's, while he's the legendary badass who's expected to go out and get shot every single day. 
I mean, he does get shot like the beginning of the Mali arc where he has to cover for, for Zeke and he just gets blasted with all the fucking um, uh, high caliber artillery shells, anti Titan rounds, and gets demolished. That's basically what he's become at that point. Like a shield that doesn't even shield well. Yeah, he's the he's the defense titan, and he can't protect anyone. Yes, <laughs> not even himself. Yeah, him uh, the least of all. But that's also like typically uh, typical for these kinds of persons' personalities that uh, they may actually be better at protecting other people than they are at protecting themselves. Yeah, in the end, it almost feels like Reiner is the voice of reason and the voice of morality in the show, almost like Armin is, where he's broken, but in a way where he, he kind of gives a shit. Yeah. Um, right, um, I remembered what I wanted to say. In This is for, for the anime. Uh, during the destruction of, um, or rather the raid on uh, Liberio, when there's like this moment where um, Reiner gets like knocked out, and uh, Gabi has to, to like shout to wake him back up, back up. And that scene is also fucking incredible. The, the voice actress for Gabi is excellent. And that scene is, yeah, it's even more than excellent. Where she just shouts uh, his name and he eventually gets up. Also, fantastic scene. That's all Reiner's existence is at that point. Is him being badgered into performing a role that he hates performing. Because he's, everyone he's who's... Like, He's like fucking Shinji at this point. Uh, he's a lot like Shinji. At least Shinji Shinji's mask is just a neutral barrier separating the obvious crybaby he is. Reiner has <laughs> to just be schizophrenic, where his outward appearance has nothing to do with his inner experience. Yes, yeah. It's nothing but him pretend. To, it's nothing but him pretending to be strong for people who are actually stronger than him, because <laughs> yeah. he has the Titan power and the whole plan rests on his shoulders. Yeah. Uh, speaking about Gabby, one thing I love about her is they in, they basically introduce Gabby in the raid on that fort, correct? Uh, yes, during the very beginning of the Mali arc. They introduce Gabby performing a false surrender, which is yep. a very serious war crime. <laughs> yes. She should logically be hung for what she did. Well, the victors write the history books. Ah, they uh, sure do. Kind yeah. of. <laughs> well, it's I, not, I don't think it's even that the victors write the history books, because in a this is a tangent. In a very literal sense, many histories of wars were written by captured enemies, you know, people who lost and then wrote it afterwards. Yeah. The issue is the victors make the movies, and the movies are what people believe. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, that factors all into the whole propaganda stuff. And by the way, the propaganda stuff. Um. I think Attack on Titan also does a very, very good um, job at um, portraying the, the dangers and the, the effectiveness of uh, propaganda and basically brainwashing and all the cultural uh, effects on people. And I think this is not something that usually gets portrayed as well in many other um, yeah, shows, media, anime that uh, try to focus on this. Like I think Attack on Titan probably might be the best or at least one of the best examples of uh, this kind of portrayal of propaganda know what the funny thing about the propaganda in attack on titan is what is it they could have just told everyone the truth and they probably still would have went along with it uh, on, on which side on mali's on, side or on the eldian side on paradise if the king said hey those walls and those titans the entire rest of the world wants to fucking kill us the titans are a deterrent do what I say, and we might survive. If he just said that, they'd probably be fine. Uh, sure, but I think in this case, the, the reason why he hasn't told them, or I mean, technically the first king who did this, hasn't told them, so that they, people can live in blissful ignorance. That uh, As, as the, the things went, uh, the, the people of uh, Paradis, uh, they did not have to suffer the crushing existential dread, basically, that there is an entire world out there that wants to kill them. Like, it's the, the ignorance thing. It's the Matrix, basically. But is it a good thing to know the truth? That's uh, the question. Is it better to know a, um, a damaging or very disconcerting truth, or is it better to live in, in ignorance? And I honestly don't know the answer. I don't really know the answer either all the time. I mean, I pick truth because I'm 
deranged, but I don't, <laughs> but I won't pretend it makes me happy or does anything for me. Yeah. I'll maybe get my reward in heaven or, you know, might not. Who knows? Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to know. There is an appeal to Attack on Titan, especially early on, which is, of course, the point, and it ties into what you're saying. It is a conflict where you can do whatever you want to the other side, and you don't have to feel any moral qualms whatsoever. In the beginning, yes. In the beginning. And we later learn it's totally synthetic, because the Titans are really there to protect the people, or at least the elites, in a very roundabout way. But they get to live in a situation where they feel a crushing sense of dread and fear of the enemy, but they have no conflictedness at all. They realize, oh, there might be enemies inside the walls as well, but the yeah. Titans are definitely an enemy. We don't have to think about that. Yes. It's being eaten, the most primal form of hating someone and fearing them. They want to eat you. Yeah. Yes. Um, another interesting thing about the Tekken Titan, when um, I only noticed this um, recently, or rather I only thought about this recently, uh, is religion. Um, because inside Paradis, only the like this wall religion exists, which um, uh, like venerates and uh, worships the walls as uh, methods of protection. And <clears throat> the church does know uh, at least parts of what's going on, but there is, seems to be no conception of like God and otherwise uh, creation type stuff, which is really weird. And then later, um, when the um, Malian volunteers with uh, on Yakupon. Uh, show up in uh, par uh, Paradise. Uh, the belief in God, in creation, and stuff like this does exist outside of Paradise. And um, on Yakupon basically says this to to Jan uh, when when they are talking. Like when Jan asks him, uh, "Why why do you think you were born with this skin color?" And on Yakupon says, "Yeah, I think the creator thought that would be interesting." The jokes about the Eldians not understanding other cultures and races and making really boneheaded comments, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> because Japan is known for doing that, and the author got in trouble for making a few faux pas with the Koreans early on in the story. Uh, so that could be a self-aware humor of, yeah, this is a little bit chauvinistic, this story. I might not be the best with understanding other people. It's not mean, no. though. I'm just silly. <laughs> no. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that's interesting that they, that, yeah, that on Paradis, they don't have, like, this sort of creator type belief. Like, I mean, everything is centered uh, around Emir and the devil of all Earth, which created the Titans and stuff like that. Well, it's funny because they basically are God. Maybe not capital G God, but the forces of creation, at least of the world they live in, are within the walls in a weird way yeah. they almost don't need religion because the supernatural is permeating their entire existence yeah that's fair kind of like uh, tolkien when tolkien wrote the lord of the rings he said there is no religion in the lord of the rings because the religiousness of the world permeates every aspect yeah so have, have you read uh, the the Cimmerillion as well like basically no i, tr I tried Bible. to several times as a young child and i could never get through it yeah okay at that age i also wouldn't have made it through like, I don't know how old I was when I read Lord of the Rings. Not that old. Uh, I, I read it after the movies, and I prefer the movies. Uh, yeah, so there's that. Mm, we, yeah. Haven't talk yeah. <laughs> yeah, we haven't talked about uh, who we think is, is best girl. What we can I, do. Oh, with. Damn, huh? Well, what? okay, I'll, very quickly I'll smother that by saying Gabby. But before we get to that. Really? Okay. I, I, ju I just like angry, feisty, violent Sundarays. That's just, that's all I want. Uh, that is one thing I also find uh, quite attractive in, at least in in anime or in in media in general. Uh, I just but... like evil women. That's all it is. <laughs> that doesn't make them evil, but uh, I I would have to say that uh, best girl is Peak. Definitely, Peak is awesome. I do love Peak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I what I was going to propose, and which we did not uh, do now because we already talked about this. I was going to uh, propose that we count to three and on basically the count of four, we would both have simultaneously set who we think is best girl. Man, that would have been brilliant if I had not ruined it. Uh, too late. <clears throat> we'll do it another time. <laughs> yeah, for some other show, yeah. I'm going to do that with Mushoku and anyone who answers wrong gets fucking banned. Yeah, yeah, like, like some, some uh, hilarious um, punishment for that. 
And the funny thing is, I already know who some of the wrong people are, and I'm going to make them do it anyway. I guess I'm among one of those uh, of those who are wrong. Don't tell me. Don't tell okay. me. Off script, I will say, in my heart, I believe you're going to say Roxy, which is understandable, but wrong. <laughs> we will see about that. If you say Sylphie, you leave the call immediately. <laughs> Non-negotiable. I, I Fuck off. If you say Roxy, to, um, you will be berated, but you can stay. I listened to um, to your Guardian, uh, Guardian Spies and uh, halfway Mushoku Tensei thing with uh, Super, and yeah, that, that came up there as well. Like your conversations about the best girls in Mushoku Tensei. I, I swear to God, I want to have a podcast where it's nothing but arguing about the, the girls in Mushoku. And I, 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 I act like it's the real podcast and that's nothing but bickering over Best Girl. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, okay, it sounded like you had a direction you wanted to go. Can I say something real quick about religion? Yeah, sure. Uh, real, uh, real quick, I'll add about the Paradise Wall Cult. That is clever because that's a religion that's totally dissatisfying and earthly. It's paganism without fun or the intrigue of creation. That is clever because it's a religion that only idiots and really easily manipulated people would be a part of. Yeah. It's an elite religion that you join because you're a conformist and you want to be part of the power structure. You're literally worshipping the barriers that contain your world and protect it from exterior reality. It's yeah. just the PMCs, but in Germany with Titans. PMCs? The professional managerial class. We can get into oh, that later. Okay. okay. Um, it's like a, a very kind of worldly type of religion because the thing that they worship does actually exist in, in, their, in their world, which I find kind of interesting. Like, the funny thing <laughs> is they go to the only place you can't see the walls to worship the walls. Like... In, don't they like worship like in the middle of uh, the yeah the they whole... go to the town square and they go inside and hang out in the church the walls are just just look at it through your window yeah okay yeah yeah and then and then they get crashed uh, crushed by by annie and <laughs> when she when she transforms at the uh, end we of could we one. could get into annie and we potentially will but you had a direction to go sir please go uh i i was more or less finished on the religion part like, before the only, that um, i thought you had a place to go before that shit i don't even remember what i was talking about before that oh that's fine i was gonna make a quick i'll make a quick comparison uh, did you ever play gears of war as a kid uh i played a little bit of the first one yes when i was a kid one thing i always noticed about my friends who really love gears of war was they always said it's so cool to have an enemy that you can just fight you don't an have to you just fight you don't have to construct some moral argument of why you Ooh, have to kill the locusts. Okay. You just okay. have to kill the locusts because they will kill you. Gears of War was a AAA franchise that was about a race war. It was about gleeful participation in a war of extermination between races or yeah. species, depending on how you frame it. But delivered in a way where they absolved all the players of guilt or having to think about the conflict deeply. And then when Gears of War reached a conclusion... They kind of did the same thing that Attack on Titan did. They introduce they introduce ambiguity and moral conflict, but then at the end they just kind of go, "Nope, it's happening anyway." Get fucked. Okay, I, I I didn't follow it um, along. Like I had to I had to crack uh, Gears of War, and um, ah, shit, I'm not sure if it was with this game, but uh, for the crack to work, you had to reset like the the clock on your computer because of the. Um, um the uh protection system that sounds uh, dumb it worked uh, strangely because um like the the protection system for the game uh, discontinued after i don't know what year but you had to reset your clock back to a time where it was still working so uh, the game would work because you know i i didn't own this game <laughs> legally um yeah, yeah, but I never finished it, and I don't have Oh my god, that's just like how Aaron has Zeke activate the paths so he can go back in time to unlock the founding Titan power and exterminate <laughs> the entire world. It's yes, the exact exactly. same thing. Playing Gears of War is Attack on Titan. <laughs> in some strange way it is. God, I'm so good at drawing connections. <laughs> yes, yes, pattern recognition... <laughs> Yeah, me and paranoid schizophrenics, that uh, epic <laughs> handshake meme. Yeah. yeah. We don't have to continue this point too much. Uh, feel free to bail out. But Gears of War was an example of that. And I think in a world where conflict is so 
taboo and especially certain types of conflict. A conflict where it's not about the elites or anything like that. A conflict where it's just a group of people trying to eviscerate another group of people. That's something that is incredibly taboo in our day and age for, you know, good reason. By now, yes. But I always notice there's this underground market that always exists where if someone can take a conflict that completely abandons moral consideration of the other side and package it in a way where normies are comfortable with it, there's always a significant minority of the population that wants to consume media like that. I really noticed it with Gears of War when I was young, and Attack on Titan is kind of the same thing. It's a total extermination war early on, but then it kind of betrays that impulse, but then it just does it anyway. Yeah, oh man, like, um, I, when, when I read the manga, and like on, on the manga sites, uh, you often have like, um, like some sort of uh, comment section below them. For some, some strange reason, I can't see them anymore. Like, something is wrong with my computer that this isn't uh, shown anymore. But, uh, like, the, the comments that were going on during the last arc, and also uh, the comments for the episodes when they came out, uh, where we had this massive split of people uh, in for one side or the other, and they were, like, arguing back and forth uh, about what the moral thing to do was. And it was kind of strange to see. Like, well, was, Aaron... Kind of, kind of ta- oh, oh, the commenters were? Yeah, I mean, well, not what they said, but the way they argue, uh, argued uh, uh, for and against uh, their and other people's viewpoints. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, I can only imagine. Uh, commenters on pirate manga sites represent the absolute epitome of human decorum, insight, nuance. Yeah. That's where Mensa recruits primarily at this point. You can prove yeah. you have an IQ in the 98th percentile if you have at least 200 comments on pirate manga sites. <laughs> the new standard. Yeah. And Attack on Titan never really gives you an out. They do actually the same thing that happened in Gears of War, at least to an extent. They give you a scapegoat. They give you one guy who you can blame the entire thing on. In the case of Attack on Titan, Eren specifically set shit up so that everyone can blame him for what happened. And fair enough, he did do it. But I don't think he believed he had a choice. Yeah, at that point Is that kind of the message of Attack on Titan? Is this shit... This shit happens no matter what, so all you can really do is pretend one guy did the whole thing, and then move on? It is kind of a theme in Attack on Titan with like the whole Helios thing, which is kind of the reverse, where you don't have a scapegoat but a hero. Um, I don't know if you know um, Alexander, the uh, any tuber and uh, person on Twitter. Who, I uh, I tried to watch a few of his videos back in the day. I really didn't like them. I do know he exists. Okay. Uh, he did a very interesting one on the whole Helios thing, for instance. Like... Um, Yesterday and the day before, he put out two Attack on Titan videos, by the way. One on uh, Magad and one on uh, Shadis. Um, right, what was I going to say? Uh, uh, we were about, talking about right, scapegoating. scapegoating. Yeah, scapegoating. scapegoating. Um, I, I was thinking for like quite a while about um, the ending of the Attack on Titan uh, manga. And I was trying to figure out if uh, I think it's good or if it's bad. And initially, I thought it was a lot worse than I think now, because ultimately, what Aaron was trying to do was, I don't think the scapegoat idea works. I think he fucks up with that. But uh, he says at multiple points throughout the story that he wants his friends to live long and happy lives. And in a strange, really fucked up way, he manages to achieve this for at least a couple of his friends. Like, they live in this, like, 50-year time period where there is no war anymore, and then Eldia gets bombed to the ground. In some strange way, he at least manages to achieve that. I'm going to punch above my weight class real quick and say, I do not know Gerard deeply. I know the basic ideas of what he says. Where Gerard's idea with scapegoating was all political orders that are stable rest on a foundation of violence, which brought it into being, And in order to keep it stable and hold it in place, you have to mystify it with legends and false memories of what happened. And the only way to do that is to create a scapegoat where where people look at what each other are doing and they mimic each other in the conflict 
and this spirals out of control until there's a moment where everyone is looking at one person. Then they blame him for everything, and that locks in the legend uh, that creates the new cultural modus operandi that lasts for a certain amount of time until shit breaks down again, then you have to do it again. Yes. Yeah. Although yeah, the problem I, I with that... It. Oh, sorry. Um, no, I, I read about it, but I also am not uh, deeply in it, so I... Yeah, I, I have no nuance on this. It's embarrassing to admit, I really, really, really need to read Gerard, but he doesn't have any audiobooks. So he keeps getting <laughs> yeah. pushed back for the sake of people like Richard Weaver and other people. But the problem with that is, Gerard said, you kill an innocent person. Yeah. You kill an innocent person, and the blood on everyone's hands, where they subconsciously know they killed an innocent person for no reason is what makes them psychologically accept the myth. And then, yeah. you know, th they hold on to it tightly. The problem is Aaron isn't innocent. They killed the exactly. guy who was actually the problem. Right. It, it wasn't work. It wasn't the birthing of a new legend of mystified violence and a new social order. They just killed the guy who was actually trying to exterminate the human race. Yeah, and it doesn't solve anything in the world in the end. Yeah, Doing things that make sense never accomplishes anything. You have to act irrationally, and then the fantasy world you plunge into is what makes things make sense. Yes, yes. It's yeah. a, a very good perspective on this. Attack on Titan is just a series of myths and illusions about the world breaking and breaking and breaking, and people get brought more and more into reality. And eventually they hit a point where, okay, there's just a bunch of arbitrary violence going on for no reason. There's no clear solution. We don't know what the fuck to do. Okay. You have yeah. to believe nonsense. That's how you don't kill people, I guess. That was kind Good of enough. a tangent. No, it was a very valuable tangent. Yeah. God damn it. Sasha is sure cute, isn't she? <laughs> she Remember is that sure potato dead. scene and yeah. where they said that she farted to the teacher? Yeah, I remember that. God that, damn, that was that so one, funny. I mean, uh, it, it's so strange that because it was Mikasa who said this, which kind of doesn't fit her character i think that she would say this like i don't know does she do something like this ever again in in the rest of the series i don't think so oh is she the one who did that yeah she says this well i don't think she was being funny i think she saw it as just a totally pragmatic decision yeah sure to to avoid like uh, the conflict see this is we're back here mystify you have to tell legends and stories and <laughs> right. <blame> innocent people <laughs> you, that that was that's the secret to understanding attack on titan because yes. he yelled sasha farted when sasha was innocent uh, and everyone goes yeah. along with the lie and that's yes. what binds them together into the survey corps oh my god it works actually this is so funny <laughs> yay yeah. ah, see this is why people don't listen to my podcast no that's exactly why they should listen to it yeah i'm a genius <laughs> the, the f <laughs> okay i never can't believe i tied those two together uh <laughs> it works so well yeah I yeah i mean sasha sasha is cute though then of course it was kind of a cheap shot when they had gabby kill sasha mm, is partially it? well like in the most literal sense it was a cheap shot where she just shot <laughs> yeah. someone who wasn't paying attention yeah and i don't think she was even aiming at her or was no she was, was aiming at her right it was just because, an act uh, of random murder gabby wasn't accomplishing goals yeah i mean if you climb into a uh, an airship with uh, enemy soldiers you do not expect to come back yeah more uh, war crimes from gabby <sighs> yeah uh, war crimes gf <laughs> uh, the, false the, the surrender Gabby, shooting unarmed civilians uh, the Gabby gang meme by uh, eh, best guy ever you remember this? did you see this? I, I, do, I do remember where Gabby is slapping her that's such a funny aspect Gabby acts like fucking Thorkel where, the, where Thor yeah. in, in Vinland Saga Thorkel's the scene where you see that Thorkel is a fun guy is when he's in the bar putting little kids on his shoulders dancing around Gabby does the same thing, but the child <laughs> is the murdering monster, not the Viking. <laughs> oh, I was sadly disappointed with, um, at least with the anime version of Vinland um, ah, Saga. But I think Torkel I like the most, which is strange. I, I only saw so the anime. Yeah, I, I, I also I do only like, saw the anime. I do like Thorkel. Vinland Saga was like deeply personal to me just because of how much I like the characters. Uh, it, uh, 
one thing that kind of already took me out of it was the production values, like the weird CG it really pulled me out of the whole thing. But I also didn't like many of the characters. Like, um, what's what's the name of the main guy? Thorfinn? Thorfinn. Thorfinn, yeah. Uh, I didn't like him. Like, he didn't work really well. And Askeladd is pretty nice, but it takes such a long time to even get to the point where um, we finally understand him. And uh, the, the priest the priest was nice when uh, yeah. he was talking about love. That, yeah, that's he's, really he's me, for real. Yeah. Hey, yeah, the priest in Vinland Saga says everything is death and death is love. Is that Attack on Titan's message? I don't know. I have no idea at that point. His take, <laughs> still on Wind and Saga, his take that uh, love is discriminatory is a uh, fucking, that's a fucking awesome perspective. I mean, in in terms of context, not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily a very pleasant uh, perspective, but it's really fucking interesting. In a way, I mean, this is a tangent that's not going in, probably. People have commented that this sort of relationship between Buddhism and Christianity Yes. Where you can almost see Buddhism as laying the substrate and defining the problems. And Christians are people who see those problems and think there is a solution. And the Buddhist perspective is a lot more resilient in many ways, but it doesn't give you the, the satisfaction and uplift that the Christian one does. Yeah, I can where, see that. Where you can almost see the, the priest falls in the Buddhism, where he loses his ability to be Christian, and he lands on a spiritual substrate, which is not he's not as happy as he was when he still believed but it's a lot more solid and it gives him some it gives him a baseline to fall to that he can build back up from yeah yeah i think that should stay in okay <laughs> okay <laughs> you can you're the boss sir you're not the boss of me you know <clears throat> I, I i try to give people oh yeah speaking of authoritarianism isn't it crazy how attack on titan wants us all to join the military uh, I think in the first episode when, when I mean Aaron wants to join like the Servi Corps from the very beginning and then we have this uh, nice and actually pretty good scene with all the fucked up um, Servi Corps members returning all injured and all distraught and fucking depressed uh, it does show us from the very beginning that this is not a pleasant thing to do and at that point in the story it's also completely fucking pointless and I think it does not want us all to join the military. I think it has a uh, in one's take on it. So you're saying I'm completely wrong? <laughs> uh, not completely wrong, but I think wrong about that uh, specific point. I, I will think say... It, oh, sorry, go. Go, go. I, I was basically just saying what I already just said. I think that um, it... Uh, it is nuanced. It shows the the value of uh, yeah of the military, but it also shows everything that's fucked up about it. It doesn't take sides in that sense. One of the hardest things in Attack on Titan is reconciling the sincere the sincere love of patriotism and being willing to fight for your people and defend people and go out and kick ass in the early parts with how complicated it gets later on, where. Yeah. Where from the beginning, they admit that the leaders are incompetent. They admit that fighting is mostly futile. You're really just buying time. Yes. Yeah. But there still is a very sincere uh, fighting spirit to the people who do go through the motions of doing this. Yeah, I do think yeah. Isayama is totally serious in his feeling of if you go out and you defend your friends, that is virtuous. Even if it's in a context where it's not really accomplishing much, it still is good that you did that. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, one way you could interpret the military mentality, especially early on, is it's not really a secret that Isayama draws heavily from World War I, early 20th century military iconography. Yes, like especially during the, 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 the early Mali arc, basically where they are fighting the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's a good point. I really should have thought about that. <laughs> Good job, Mister History Degree. Yeah, but I don't have. I don't have one. <laughs> oh, were you referring to yourself? <laughs> okay. Yep. <laughs> the yeah. uh, but in the early 1900s, late 1800s, there was a big sense of everything grinding to a halt. There were a bunch of values and norms that were held over from an earlier time when imperialism was a much more accepted. It was much more healthy. It was much more expansive and capable. Where all the old European nobility imperial mindset strategies 
were ceasing to work, collapsing in on each other and leading people into bizarre stalemates where the machine was just running on autopilot yes. and eating itself. And eating all the people that were involved. Yes, uh. and eating all the people involved. And it's not even just the German thing. People have pointed out that they reference uh, the Charge of the Light Brigade, which was a British oh, patriotic I didn't, song. I didn't even think about it, but yes, yeah, that makes sense. I don't know if that was just the dub, but it is in there somehow, so I'm counting it. I mean, it makes... Ah, ah actually, it does not work as well as I thought it does, because okay. the, the Charge of the Light Brigade was a mistake. It was a mistaken command. There was no charge order that was mis... Uh, misinterpretation by the but, new commander but it's still heroic that they perform the action even though it didn't make sense right <laughs> ah that's is it heroic to do something even if it does not accomplish anything and the reason for doing it was a mistake like was a miscommunication is it still heroic or is it just stupid at that point i don't know but i think that's kind of the that's kind of the vibe of Attack on Titan. Being a hero I mean, in, and being stupid are kind of the same thing. Somewhat. In Attack on Titan, it does work because everyone just uh, openly calls for this attack and uh, everyone knows they are going to die. In that case, it's a rogue and it makes sense. And it does achieve, um, of course, what it uh, was set out to achieve, although Zeke manages to survive. But yeah, in Attack on Titan, it definitely works. That was actually one of the hardest scenes for me to watch, where the guy with the stupid Mo Howard haircut, uh, Marlo? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, one of the three stooges is right next to Captain Irwin, riding heroically towards a hail of missile, a hail of supersonic boulders, knowing that he's about to die. And it his last thought great. is his last thought is about the girl that he loves back in the corrupt police department he's a part of, yeah. and he's just walking in the death, and he knows that this is a mostly futile action. He's just buying them a few minutes to maybe rally and defend themselves, and he still keeps going. That was hard to watch. And it worked. Luckily, it worked. It was not for nothing. It was one of the very few actions in the show by a low-level military person that actually did accomplish something. Uh, I think Evan was actually quite effective with his, uh, tech, uh, with his yeah, strategic and uh, tactical employment. Uh, I mean, it doesn't always, it did not always, um, like, completely work, like, with when they uh, try to trap and capture Annie in, in, the, in the forest. She still managed to escape, but um, the, the whole thing kind of worked. Yeah, it did. Ir Irwin's cool. Irwin's cool. Irwin is great. Levi's Another cool. great character. Yeah. Basically, the entire, the entire military competence of the country of Eldia is the Survey Corps plus Pixis. Yes. Is there anyone else? Uh, Niles, uh, I think that's his name, the, the leader of the military police. I think he's competent, but the rest of the military police might not be. Ni yeah, is it's... it Niles or Niles? I don't know. Oh, and, uh, and Zach, uh, Zachary. Zachary was one of the most confusing characters in the story to me. <laughs> uh, he's fucked up, but I'm not because sure if he's... He flip-flops between being this greater scope character who knows everything, knows a lot more than he lets on, and is steering us towards a conclusion, and being just another random toady who happens to be really powerful. And I never really understood how much he understood... I never really understood what his goals were. I think or how his, Or how big his plans were. I think he just did this uh, because uh, he thought it was fun. I think it's pretty much implied that he just really did not like, uh, um, like the, the, political, was the political or the military, uh, military leadership. And he just wanted to. Uh, to I think get especially the nobility. He fucking hates the nobility. Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but yeah. Well, you see a scene where I think it's a noble. He's tied to a chair with a funnel yeah. in his butt. Oh Jesus, that fucking. What thing. are you pouring in there, Zachary? Or is something pouring out? Oh, uh, and at least that chair ends up killing him. So that's nice. Uh, yep. The corruption of the society flips back and forth in how much sense it makes as well. I like the nobles being useless because that ties back into, you know, the early 20th century iconography. After World War yeah. I, uh, there was a lot of pop psychology going around of why the fuck did this happen? <laughs> Freud had one of his weirdest takes of all time where he eventually just reached the conclusion, I think people just want to die. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Freud looked at World War one. Well, you'll hear the death drive referenced yeah. Uh, yeah. relative to Freud. Uh, an episode of Mad Men 
reference the death drive and they tried to build an advertising campaign around the joy of death <laughs> <laughs> it was a, i, it I was only sh- watched the first season and like oh that's fine it was a episode. That was shot down very quickly by the guy who owned the company. But the psychologist lady on staff did try to do that. That's Freud, funny. Freud tried to come up with a psychological model of World War I for a long time and eventually just gave up and said, eh, I guess people just want to die. Fuck it. Yeah, I, I know about the, the Thanatos thing, which they then <laughs> tried to use in uh, Wonder Egg Priority as well, where it did not work so well. No, but one of the other pop psychological theories was the leaders in World War I often had very strong ties to the nobility or just were nobles. Yeah. And a motif of how soldiers tend to see the leaders in World War I was people who were stuck in the past and refused to accept that modern military conditions had rendered the mentality fucking pointless. I, I once read that um, uh, Longstreet, the uh, Confederate general, that he had come up with a, um, a design for basically trench warfare which was rejected at that point in time. The American Civil War actually holds a really unique place in military history because it basically predicted what was going to happen in World War I uh, before other countries were ready for Part of the hesitation of America to get into World War I was the Civil War was still in living memory, so people had kind of a ghost of an understanding of how miserable the warfare conditions would be. Yeah. Because the Union side was basically the first modern army, and they were fighting an aristocratic plantation agrarian style economy. So you basically had a 1700 style army fighting a 20th century army almost towards the end. Would you really say it was this, uh, this uh, uh, unbalanced? Uh, yeah, especially okay. towards it. By the end of the war, the Union had automatic and repeating rifles. Yeah. The issue, uh, I mean, this is really a tangent at this point. It's fine. It was basically this. The actual arms that people had to use to fight each other were fairly equal over the North and South. But the North had an industrialized economy backing it up. They had railroads basically going to the front. So the entire logistics angle of the Northern thing was basically a 20th century operation. Yeah, I know. I know about that. And the South was basically feudal, where it was just, oh, there's farmers. You leave your farm for a while. You go fight. You come back to your farm. You get your own weapon. You're a citizen defending your place in the social order. And the North was, you know, a capitalist juggernaut. And Gettysburg, if you look at the fight at Gettysburg, it resembled trench warfare a great deal, at least on the Union side. Uh, I think, uh, how was it, Petersburg? It was also, where, when did they blow up the, like, the giant fucking bomb? Was in, it Petersburg? In America? Yeah, during the Civil War. I, I don't remember. Yeah, the, the Battle of the Crater. Um... I think it's Petersburg. But at Gettysburg, they went on top of a hill where there was an old cemetery, and they tore yeah. up all the tombstones, and they built little bunkers and foxholes out of them. And the command structure broke down, so it just become it just turned into a bunch of dudes hunkered in little stone foxholes shooting down the hill. And towards the end, Lee tried to launch a cavalry charge, yeah. and it got fucking obliterated, and like yeah, every Pickett's. single horse died, and not a single Union person was injured. Pickett's charge, yeah. Have you seen yeah. the movie or read uh, the book nope. The Killer Angels, which no, nope. I on... participated in a singing contest where they taught us about it. A what contest? A singing contest. Singing contest. Okay. I had an eccentric professor in college, and I took his Civil War class, and he turned it into a singing competition. Where he divided us into the North and South and gave us songbooks and said, okay, 95% of the grade is we're going to have a scene off at the, on the final week. So go rehearse for the scening competition. Who, who decides who wins or what was the uh, we had a panel of ju- We had a panel of judges, but he called it a tie, which I think was what he wanted the whole time. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I forgot what we were talking about. Oh, yeah. We were talking about Gettysburg. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Gettysburg. Yeah. What the fuck were we talking about? <laughs> oh, yeah. We were talking but, about uh, yeah, World War I. But one universal aspect of how soldiers felt in World War I was that the people leading them were delusional and completely out of their mind and had no fucking clue what they were doing. Yep. And this was often attributed to them having an old concept of what warfare it was that was grounded in imperial conquest of foreign lands and had a lot of carryover to the times when knights were on horses running around with sticks. And I think Isayama's love of early 20th century military iconography, I think that's part of it. 
and his portrayal yeah. of the nobles of it's an extremely cynical fighting force where the people fighting some of them are real motherfuckers but virtually no one above them has a fucking clue and the few that do are fucking psychopaths yeah that's pretty much it it is god damn it annie has a big ass as the titan you ever notice that not particularly yeah it, fucking like, literally you, it's uh, like a mile wide have you like a, a screenshots of every of the female titans and have their asses lined up right next to each other so you can compare you know, okay this is the biggest I, ass i don't <laughs> have that i think i know a man who could make that happen <laughs> it's not me <clears throat> it's it's bruce yeah of course yeah he could <laughs> female titan ass frame bot i'm doing this <laughs> oh my god that would actually blow up yeah it would oh there is actually there is an artist who uh, draws like basically uh not just characters from attack on titan but from other anime as well with a massive focus on their ass basically i have no idea what the, the person is called but i have seen images from it i think early in attack on titan there were a few turning points where I think the best part of Attack on Titan was Trost. The part where you bailed. Really? Really. I think That was the part I Okay, you go first. I love Trost because it's the point in the story where the Titans are the most threatening and improvisation and grit and survival instinct plays the biggest part in overcoming them. Where you have characters getting fucking trapped, you have characters losing their gas, you have characters making improvised weapons and making doohickeys where they have the giant loading bay in the empty warehouse, and they're yeah. trying to shoot their fucking eyes out, then run around with a sword. It's the point where the Titans are overwhelming, our characters are just barely competent enough to barely win with most of them surviving if they're lucky, and we play that out and we have a clear endpoint by the end. And I really, oh, I really love that. As it goes along, the Titans gradually get less and less threatening and have less and less agency of their own. Um, That's where the Titans you, are the coolest. Yeah, all of what you just described, I agree with. But the, the problem I had with Trust is that it dragged on so long that the pacing turned into such a slog. I don't know if you divide uh, Trust in like the pre Aaron transformation and after Aaron transformation, or rather. When uh, Pixis arrives and uh, has Aaron carry the stone, if you split this in between, or if you, I see this as uh, as one thing, and seen as one thing, it's just way too fucking long, and it's honestly the the hardest part for me to get through every time I watch Attack on Titan. But uh, yeah, the whole um, stuff with people running out of gas and uh, the scene with I'm not sure if it's like a sort of elevator where they're all uh, firing at the eyes of the Titans and stuff like that. That's all awesome. That uh, I agree with. I just take it as a total given that the early sections of Attack on Titan, the pacing is horrible and you just have yeah. to accept that. Yes. It goes without saying. Okay. I, I was saying it because, yeah. Because that that's is like the, the hardest part for me to get through in Attack on Titan. It's where I dropped it the first time. But Trost is my favorite part. And I think the female Titan arc is one of the better it's, parts as well. Yes. Because it's that's the first encounter. Run. Yeah, it's the first encounter with human level intelligence Titans before you understand what they are yes that part i really liked and or still really like uh, and what made it even more interesting was um the the beginning of the intrigue where um Erwin tells uh, every basically every squad in in his position a different information on where Aaron is located so that they can narrow down where the traitor is uh, coming from basically that's fucking clever. I mean, I've seen this in, in other shows, but uh, Erwin uses it, and it works. And that's awesome. That is awesome. And Erwin is an intelligent character written believably. Yeah. Uh, so is Armin. It's not that they have this precognition of the future. They just actually think to do clever shit. Where that's yeah. the thing about smart people. Normal people don't improvise at all. Smart people, their plans tend to be simple. They're just the only people who come up with them. Yeah, okay. You're like, okay, maybe that's just me fucking spewing off. <laughs> They're also good at math. Ah, math, logical thinking. I don't know. I, I suck at it. I don't know. We've talked about a lot of things in this. Yeah. We've covered a lot of ground. Much like the rumbling. <laughs> no it did not cover much ground that was my oh point. right <laughs> oh okay well there's no point here either i guess <laughs> a fun thing to do we could just hit up a few characters we like that yeah. we haven't talked much about yet 
Like, how I do think you feel about be. Annie? Because I really like Annie. I think, I think she's you, adorable. I yes. think every male character should have been her boyfriend. <laughs> like um, she's cool. Uh, like uh, the the outward appearance of Annie was actually quite an influence on uh, how a character in my novel looks like to an extent. Not exactly her character, but to some small extent as well. So yeah, I really do like Annie and her portrayal. And even though she is often like portrayed in some scenes uh, as kind of uh, psychotic, like when she's stepping on on the box or whatever that is in in her um, in her flashback, but uh, I really do like her as a character and the way she looks. I, I like Annie too. She's just cool. She's, yeah, she's just like, a selfish person that just wants to live and be with her dad again. Yeah, and a relatable goal much, that everyone yeah. can appreciate. Yeah, and she does pretty much everything so that she can achieve her goals. She's also very easy to forgive, where you could make the case, okay, a few of those deaths were more gruesome than they probably need to be. Fair enough, but by yeah, the but end, the not a lot of people... Yeah. yeah, by the end, not a lot of people can throw stones at that. Fucking Aaron, Aaron grabs the fucking crystal guy, puts it in the jaw titan's mouth, smashes it, and then slurps up the liquid. He really probably didn't need to do that. What's worse is that he that he deliberately targeted um, the uh, the Eldian uh, refugee, well, not refugee, ghetto um, location, so that aliens would be um, innocent aliens would be uh, killed in this attack. Like he was completely completely fucked up in in what he did there. An Just innocent so... Eldian, such a funny concept. You're such uh-huh. a humorous man, Jaws. Yes, indeed. <laughs> They're bad uh, people. Didn't you see their uh, arm sleeves? The, uh, the point is that Aaron himself is Eldian. So him, him basically, I wouldn't call this a false flag attack, but him uh, deliberately uh, killing Eldians even in this attack um, is ridiculous. It's a shithead flag attack. He's just admitting he's a jerk. Yeah. He's and a- that he doesn't <laughs> get shit for this is strange. I think he gets like a little bit of shit for killing them, but not much. Yeah, um, but... but- Tying that back to Annie, I did find it disappointing that Annie was gone for such a big stretch of the show because yeah. she was one of the most likable and interesting characters. You really yes. want to know when she's going to pop out of that ice crystal thing. But by the time she shows up again and she's munching on the food next to all the other refugee army <sighs> people and they realize it's her, by that time so much shit has happened. It's I don't even feel any guilt whatsoever. It's like, ah, get in here, you knucklehead. What have you been up to? <laughs> Uh, I think that scene actually kind of sucks in a way because she sits like right next to Connie and he just laughs at uh, how at the way she's eating pie. And the last time Connie saw um, Annie was when she was like fucking destroying shit and killing people inside the city. So that didn't work for me. I mean, as, as a viewer, I'm absolutely and totally glad that we got uh, Annie back. But it, uh, the way it's portrayed at this little scene uh, doesn't work. Like I, th- I think the initial scene of uh, Annie getting out of the crystal and her encounter with Hitch, that works. That's good. That was a good scene. I'm fine with the first one. I mean, at this point, if Connie's going to hate anyone, it's going to be Zeke. Because Zeke turned his mom yeah. into the fucking yeah. Titan with no legs. I think that's a very human thing. Of You have different clusters of association in your head. It helps that Annie was only ever doing shit in the female Titan form. Yeah, true. From their perspective, it's kind of easy to separate the female Titan and Annie as a person and separate yeah. entities. Yeah, okay, if he ever watches sense. her turn into the female Titan again and just thinks about it for a while, maybe he'll get upset. But it's like a, it's like when Griffith comes back and Guts has the moment of just being happy to see Griffith again. Yeah. Uh, it helps that I'm not really the, the biggest justice guy, I guess. I can just shrug. I'm not really a justice person. I, I'm, not, I'm not calling this out uh, because of uh, justice problems, but uh, just writing problems once again. It, it didn't make that much sense in terms of uh, Connie's character. But yeah, it, uh, it kind of works when you say that uh, he probably would associate uh, basically the destruction and death and carnage that uh, Annie brought, uh, that he would associate that more with her titan form than with her human form. That makes yeah, sense. People, people don't know what they know. They know what they see. And if you never see Annie be bad in Annie form, did it really happen? Yeah, true. 
But by the way, can we agree that um, the Hitch, when she was animated by Studio Wood, is uh, prettier than when she is animated by Mappa, even though the Mappa version is much closer to the manga version of Hitch? I will delegate to you and say yes. Okay. Uh, I wasn't I think, paying that much attention. <laughs> really? You did not notice the, the difference between nope. Hitch from the first seasons and from the later ones? Uh, to be completely honest, after the first few seasons, I read the manga. Okay, okay. I did go back and listen to some of the music, because Attack on Titan has some good music. Oh, Especially yes, that's some of the, of the openings, ones. because the <laughs> openings are are blatantly militaristic in a way that <laughs> the, the yeah. show is not. Yeah, they are like uh, super over the top with this. But they, they yeah. do sound great and they get your heart pumping. They are great. And the music in general in Attack on Titan yeah. is one of the other things that's absolutely amazing about it. Uh, I think one character we should talk about, uh, which we have not yet, is uh, Flock. Oh, fuck. Which one's Flock again? Uh, the red haired guy. Basically, Aaron's right-hand man. His number one fanboy. Oh, fuck. The, the head Jaegerist guy. Not the one with the stupid haircut, but the other one. He does have he does have a stupid haircut. I don't the know less one stupid does. haircut of the of the two. The other one's like Yellen or something. Yelena, where she has a, a bowl cut. Oh, okay. No, I don't mean Yelena. I mean uh, Flock with his red hair. With the Jaegerus, I just kind of got lost episode to episode. Where okay, these people seem really passionate. I don't totally understand if they're good or bad or not, or where this is going. Yeah, like Flock. He started out as, uh, out as this guy who really didn't know what he was getting into when he joined the, the Survey Corps. And then the whole disaster in Shiganshina happens where pretty much everyone but him. I think he actually is the only survivor of the charge. The only fucking guy who survived Aaron's charge. And uh, at that point, he really doesn't like Aaron, which is strange given how much of a fanboy he becomes of Aaron later on. And he tries to convince um, Levi to revive uh, Erwin instead of Armin. And oh, he has, fuck. He is the one who did that. Yeah, and he has pretty good arguments, actually. And I think if, if I had been there, if I had been Levi, I probably would have listened to Flock's argument at that point. I think that would have been a better choice from my perspective. Um, and yeah. It's weird that they resolve that conflict by deciding, you know what, Erwin has earned death. That's actually kind of cool, I think. It is cool. It's an odd idea, <laughs> but it is cool. Yeah, it worked. It definitely worked. Throughout all of Attack on Titan, it always just comes down to people committing war crimes constantly is just what happens. It's just mm -hmm. the sympathetic characters are the ones who like their friends, and the unsympathetic ones are the ones who have plans. Ah. <sighs> Yeah, or who do um, kind of questionable things in pursuit of their plans, yes. Yeah, it's kind of kind of how it can be split up. It's, it's funny how you brought up how out of character it was for Connie to be so forgiving. You forget the final scene where him and Gabby are doing big high fives together in spite of her shooting Sasha right in the heart. Ah, uh, shit, when, when, does that, when, when are they high fiving? I made that up. Okay, I fell joke. for it. It's bad. I fell for it. When I was rereading the, the, the last couple chapters of Attack on Titan, there is one really funny fucking panel in it. Um, after, after all the guys who got turned into Titans by the fucking gas thing, I think we should maybe talk about the, the fucking centipede thing. Um, after they are turned back to human again, um, <laughs> there's a scene where uh, Falco runs towards Gabi to embrace her and she just fucking slams him to the ground, like, basically as a reflex, and it, it just happens in the background, and it's so fucking funny. That she just drops him. <laughs> Everything with Gabby is just fucking adorable yeah. and funny. She's a good character, because the show is getting tired at that point, so they introduce just the most despicable little creep of a child, and it's great. <laughs> it works. It's and, like when I mean, sitcoms it's... go on too long, and they get a new kid sidekick. Oh, uh, okay. No, because in, in Attack on Titan, it works. It works both ways. She's both the super obnoxious, over-the-top, uh, kind of despicable character in the beginning, and then she has a very genuine working arc where she becomes a super nuanced and greatly written and performed character. Yeah, it's a, a very good example of how to do this correctly. 
Yeah, it's funny that being the ultimate child soldier sets her up for having this whole arc of realizing, oh, maybe that wasn't the best thing to be. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more like the, the, the propaganda part of it, uh, her brainwashing. As you reach the end of the show, like a third of the cast that actually are involved in the conflict are somehow motivated by Gabby, where she's a horrible, horrible person, but she has this magnetic personality where she just has yeah. this little cluster of male characters who are very strongly motivated to save her from herself. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Rainer's whole scheme is to guilt the one guy into becoming the Titan before Gabby can become it. Yeah, that's like an ongoing thing as well. Always trying to, to protect uh, the person who's they don't want the Titan to inherit. Reiner was acting with the world in mind because he knows that Gabby getting a Titan form is something that the Earth just cannot absorb. <laughs> and would destroy the entire universe. The rumbling two. Yeah. Gabby gang. Yeah, I'm think I, I don't know. Are there any characters we missed? Any or I anything th interesting uh, we, have, we missed? Yeah, one one last thing because um, we haven't talked about this is uh, Mikasa and the the actual ending of what she has to do to achieve the ending and what that might mean. That's uh, actually a good thing to talk about. We can we can talk about like the literal final conflict. Uh, I'll be right back after pee real quick. Yes, of course. All right. Yes, welcome back. Yeah, fucking goddammit. Also got a little a little cup of espresso so I can power <laughs> through this and Should keep be. moving forward. Oh, yes. Just yeah. like Aaron, keep moving forward. That's all that matters. Just keep moving forward. Yeah. Solves all problems. What do you think, Jaws? <sighs> ah, kind of. I mean, uh, one thing that I could have brought up, but uh, since I haven't finish reading Tokyo Ghoul or rather Tokyo Ghoul we, I cannot bring this up because it would be a massive spoiler but there are massive uh, similarities between the end of uh, Tokyo Ghoul and the end of Attack on Titan but I cannot go into this and with what you just said you reminded me of that so yeah but we can drop that line here and uh, move on to the Mikasa thing and the actual yeah, ending keep of Attack on Titan keep moving forward from Tokyo yes. Ghoul to Mikasa yes I think like the, the final conflict with like all the fucking titans and uh, more like the, the Aaron producing like the, the Warhammer titans or rather the titans produced with his Warhammer power that is super fucking confusing and I don't remember much of that but then we have the, the, the final thing where um, they blow blow off um, the, the head of the, the Aaron titan skeleton thing and then the, the kind of centipede thing uh, comes out and they, then they have to like fight both Eren or rather Eren comes back a little bit later and they have to fight the, the fucking centipede and I don't like this. I really don't like the um, exist well not the existence of the centip uh, centipede but the, the fact that it's kind of like this strange inhuman final boss kind of thing it kind of feels like naruto all over again i knew you were gonna say that really you did okay when you started it's leading into a greater scope villain that is inhuman appearing out of nowhere it's like yeah here we fucking okay. go okay okay yeah believe uh, so, it oh, fuck. yeah <laughs> yeah like the, the 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 fight with the centipede doesn't work and then when we get to Aaron again, because Aaron doesn't die from from getting his head blown off from his fucking Titan form somehow, um, when we then have to get uh, Mikasa into the mouth of the giant Aaron Titan at that time that Aaron has reconstructed, and um, then we have the strange stuff with with Emir, like the the whole thing somehow that. Uh, Emir wanted Mikasa to <laughs> basically to kill Eren to to get over her um, kind of uh, compulsive love for for Eren, uh, and that's also kind of strange. I mean, it is said in that chapter that is it said in that chapter? I'm not sure that Emir still loved uh, the the king, like the king who fucking basically raped her and uh, raised her village and destroyed everything. And that also was really kind of strange. Uh, that what was strange. That? I'm also fine with that because that is exactly the type of thing that happens all the time in real life. Okay. Yeah. If you went back to like medieval history 
and you could like talk to the women. I think you would find weird shit like that all the time of like, oh, this keen fucking destroyed my keep and raised my people and then kidnapped me away to his realm. It's like, ah, whatever, I'm fine. (laughs) I'm not saying that's every or even most people in that situation, but I think people just figured shit out back then. Yeah, when they have to, yes. One other interesting thing. Uh, I mean, when we get the the whole Emir flashback, uh, she gets blamed for leaving like the door open for like the the pigs or the cattle or something. And we later we get another tiny flashback scene. I think it's just a panel or two where uh, we see Emir staring at the opened gate, and it is kind of implied that maybe not that she opened the gate, but that she saw the open gate and did not close it. That that was like potentially her only ever act of rebellion because otherwise she has been completely uh, subservient the entire time but it's only implied so it's not sure if um, the, the panel is saying that she either opened the gate or left it open on purpose even when she saw it open i will tell you jaws everything from gabby shooting aaron onwards is a fever dream that I could I had a very hard time processing what was happening the entire time. Yeah, I totally understand that. Isayama's fatal fucking flaw is complexity addiction and attributing multiple sources of cause to the same event. And when Aaron comes completely out as the bad guy, that is when it goes into complete overdrive and he just loses his fucking mind. Yeah, it, it goes bad shit. And especially in a visual sense, like you cannot fucking really understand what the fuck is going on anymore in his final fights. It's also the point where his inexperience as an artist and him not having a great understanding of layout and clear visual communication, he chose a really bad way to resolve this based on his actual skills. Maybe that's partially yeah, a result. Yeah, okay. Of as he got better at drawing, I think he got a lot better at drawing titans and set pieces than he did drawing faces and people. So yeah. maybe he got a little carried away at the end of, okay, it's time for me to show off my skills. I'm going to draw nothing but titans exploding uh, inside other titans and turning into other titans. And uh, the landscape will be made of titans. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible that he thought something like this. I'm going to show you what I've learned, Sensei. We also haven't talked about Zeke much, which kind of was an oversight. We, we can tie Zeke into this because Zeke... Yeah, of course. If I remember right, Zeke spends a large portion of this uh, dying and also lounging around in Sand World, being confused and realizing that Aaron played him like a fiddle. Um, yeah, about this. like He's like basically locked up in, in Aaron as the Titan or something like that. Um. But he has this really great conversation with uh, with Armin um, when uh, Armin also gets like trapped in in this realm for like a short time period. I don't know if time even fucking exists in in the path sent. I don't think so. Yeah, it probably doesn't. And where Zeke, his this total pessimist um, who thinks that being anti anti natalist, I should say who thinks that being born is like the worst fucking thing in, in the world, uh, where he has this really touching uh, conversation with Armin, where Armin basically presents to him the, the philosophy and the concept of like living in the moment, and uh, Zeke finally gets it, where he uh, remembers this moment where he plays catch with uh, Xara, and that that moment validates his entire existence, and uh, then we see him uh, basically gain control back from from Aaron, and uh, he partially emerges from the the skeleton, and then gets killed by Levi. But uh, before he gets killed by Levi, he says something like, "Man, the the weather today is really nice. I wished I uh, had recognized the sooner." And that's a fucking brilliant um, end to to Zeke's character. Zeke is one of those characters. It's impossible to know how you really feel about him. Because when they introduce Zeke, it's in a context where all he's doing is cruelly tearing apart characters that we already like. (laughs) Yeah. They set Zeke up in a situation where it's almost impossible to like him or expect that you will. And as it goes along, it's not like Zeke gets redeemed, per se. It's more you understand. It's more you get a picture of Zeke that makes you think, in better circumstances, Zeke might have been a cool dude. 
Yeah, he would have probably been a totally nice and normal guy if not uh, all the shit that happened to him and what. Yeah, he's not. Mal- he's not malicious in the way that Aaron is. He's yeah, not just. At all. He's just not equipped to survive. He's not equipped for the world that he inherited. Yeah. I, I kind of get it. If Zeke was alive today, he would just be a graphic artist in Boston. He would sometimes <laughs> tweet annoying shit that was just slightly too PC that made you... You, didn't, you wouldn't want to follow him because you know his opinions on political issues would annoy you. But it's like, okay, he seems like a cool dude. I'll retweet his art every now and again. I hope but he has he a good be, life. He would be a baseball player. Yes, Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Wait. Oh, right. Ha, 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 ha. It wasn't even a joke. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a joke. Well, he would have to be born in Japan then, because they actually have baseball there. Yeah. And in, or in the U.S. I think that's one thing, tiny tangent, that uh, baseball managed to become so fucking popular in, in uh, Japan just because of the U.S. occupation is kind of a strange thing. Yeah, and then it collapsed in America. And America, the most sports-loving country in the world... Doesn't really care that much about baseball anymore, but Japan still really? likes it. Okay, I didn't know about well, like the decline of popularity. Uh... Oh fuck, I don't know. Back in like the fifties and sixties, like baseball was a huge deal in America, and like it's still one of the big sports. But yeah. f- I think I think football has totally replaced it as like the big one. Okay. Like like baseball used to be the god of American sports, and it still has its fans, but it is not that anymore. And it's still called the World Series, even though yeah. it's only <laughs> in the US. That's, that's yeah. the joke. Yeah. We're, uh, we're, we're old-timey comedians today. Yeah. Yep, but Zeke is not a strong personality. It almost reminds me of my feelings on the Shiki <laughs> situation. Yeah, I, I watched that video again. There are people who are not psychologically equipped to participate in a race war, and Zeke is one of them. Yeah, if I would be in that situation, I would also be one of those kinds of people. I'm not sure what I would do. I would probably do whatever it took for me to escape and then just go away. Yeah, like to try to survive and the rest comes later, kind of. Yeah, I would just have a gun and a pile of rocks being like, okay, I don't care who wins, just don't come here. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it depends if they're vampires, though. That changes things. Uh, <laughs> I have not seen Shiki, but I've seen your video about it and some other stuff. Oh, really? I don't know your taste that well. I think Shiki would have your name all over it. I watched the first episode, and I but this was like a long that a long time ago, and uh, yeah, like the character designs and <laughs> the, the hair uh, pulled me out of it. Shiki is the slowest of slow burns. Yeah, the goofy hair is just I don't know why that's there. It's a mean it's just, at this point, it's just yeah. a weird thing about Shiki that every everyone has the dumbest anime haircuts, but everything else is played so straight. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but Zeke, as it goes along, all you can really do is feel sorry for him, kind of. Yeah. yeah. Where in real life, you'd probably still see him as the enemy, but okay, Zeke never had a shot. He was just caught up in the gears of Marley, Eldian, race war shenanigans, and he never really had a chance. Yeah, I mean, in, in the real world, if he, would, <laughs> if he would be basically captured, he would be a guy who would be hung at Nuremberg or something like this. So, yeah. It's funny that Gabby is almost the person Zeke was supposed to be. But everyone else is going to yeah. swoop in and save Gabby from herself before she has a chance to turn into a complete monster. Zeke, if he had psychologically been like Gabby, he probably would have been the ultimate killing machine. Yes. But he was a sensitive sweet boy who got caught up in <laughs> who got caught up in the worst conflict ever. And so yeah. he just gets to stare off in the distance as Armin teaches him about life in the last 10 seconds he can live. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Any other thoughts about Zeke? I think I I don't have much more to say about him at this point. Yeah, but Zeke comes back and he dies. Oh, wait. Zeke comes back and dies. As the conflict keeps going, the number of people who are relevant keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller until we're basically down to the original trio. It's just Eren, yeah. Armin, and Mikasa. Yes. Armin gets to kind of do something he gets to become the colossal titan really quick as Aaron turns into the colossal attacker hammer strike double cross super titan guy he, i don't know he's a transformer at this point or well, he used to be the transformer right before that i think at this point he can only make like this giant Aaron titan 
So Aaron turns into an abstract block of flesh that is the culmination of all the sins he's committed up until now. Which, yes. which just looks like the Colossal Titan with a stupid head. Yes. And he just loses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all yeah. that shit, and he just gets easily beaten by the person who was logically going to beat him the whole time. Yeah, I mean, he knew he was going to be beaten this way. He just played it out. One thing about the final battle of Attack on Titan, the final th narrative thrust to the finish line, if nothing else, it will always be memorable for creating some of the most shockingly incompetent panels in the history of manga. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even remember like a specific um, moments where that's line. true. The first one I'm thinking of is when all the former Survey Corps guys and Gabby, for some reason, realize they're going to go after Eren and defeat him. They're all just staring awkwardly into the camera, saying, to save the world. Oh, okay. That became such a huge meme, because it just looks... It's staged like a family portrait. People are just standing around, and the people in front are sitting on their knees. But <laughs> everyone's <laughs> face looks slightly uncomfortable. Connie, who says it, is yeah. all determinatively staring into the camera. Everyone else just looks uncomfortable, or like they walked in by coincidence. Gabby looks like she has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I thought it became a meme because of the of the corniness of the sentence. I didn't even uh, pay much attention to the, the layout. Well, I think it's both the context of the sentence and how poorly the visuals sync up with that, where it just looks awkward and silly. Yeah. Where it's this badass moment, but people don't look badass. They look like they're being slightly annoyed while they're worrying about other things. <laughs> Yeah, it does I swear that God, work. Gabby and the per Gabby and the people next to them, they look like they have to pee, and they're just letting Connie have his moment so they he won't be rude. <laughs> yeah, we don't know if that wasn't the case in universe, you know. And then maybe the worst panel in the history of manga panels. There might be a worse one. I don't know what it would be. It's not even that the panel is that bad to look at. It's just such an anticlimax emotionally, where Mikasa is holding Aaron's severed head kissing it and emir is just standing in the corner staring at them honestly i really do like that panel i like the fact that it exists but speaking about it as an attempt to capture a certain emotion i think it was not effective at that i mean i think emir shouldn't have been in the background but uh, it would have yeah. been fine if she wasn't if she wasn't there it would have been kind of weird but basically makes sense but yep. Ymir is there, she's standing at a 30 degree angle to the floor for no reason. Like she's doing a <laughs> Michael Jackson dance in the background as Mikasa makes out with the severed head of the sexless uh. weirdo who just obliterated 90% of the human race. And she's just staring with a goofy look on her face like, hmm, yeah. what did I walk in on here? She's supposed to be knowing and ephemeral and otherworldly, but it just looks like some stupid girl from a local farm is moonwalking in the background while this really powerful moment is happening. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that totally ruins the scene if one thinks about it like that. Oh, what I also thought was really fucking stupid was um, also after the, all the, the Titan gas stuff gets undone and people return to normal, that we then have in the smoke that's receding, we have like all the former members of the um, Survey Corps that have died, like Sasha and oh, so. And with this Hunch. is. And uh, it's um, just uh, presented as if they are, like, really there. Like, you see um, Connie and Jan both seeing Sasha basically standing in the smoke. So it's basically implied as that really happened. That's not a metaphor. And I thought that makes no sense at all. You know, I was okay with that. Where That was an awkward scene. But I think it did deliver what they were trying to trying to do. Yeah, I, I thought it would have been uh, better if they had, if they had, uh, if Isayama had made it clearer that uh, this is like an, a, a subjective experience for the characters and not an objective one that does happen in reality. We we are talking about when Hanj dies, right? No, 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 no. Um, uh, oh fuck! Uh, no. I fucked up. And uh, that's a very similar scene. No, um, at the very end of oh, my, how many Titan, times does he fucking do this? I think he does it three times. He does it with Erwin, he does it with Hanji, and he does it at the end. 
Okay, see, this is the whole problem. They have the same emotional beats over and over and over again because he... Yes. I, I swear to God, I think Isayama, at this point, he was writing for the anime on some level, and he remembered people complained about how stretched out shit was early on. So he's just like, okay, I'm going to just make this scene last 50 chapters just to make sure the animators have enough material. You know, they can <laughs> cut some out if they want. I mean, the, the scene works when, um, when we see it with Irving. And when we see it with Hanji, because in this case, uh, it communicates clearly enough that it's uh, subjective and the people are not actually there. But in the end, he specifically has John and uh, Connie react to this simultaneously to seeing Sasha. Like this happened in the real world. It's not subjective. That just happened. Well, at this point, we've established that time travel telepathy is a normal part of the world. Fucking maybe. Maybe Aaron yeah. hooked him up. Maybe Aaron's last act as a genocidal maniac man was just, hey, guys, you want to leave a little voice message for the folks who lived? You know, the ones I didn't kill. Let's do that yeah. right before we meet yeah. Satan. <laughs> uh, yeah, it must have been something like that. OK, well, sorry. I, <laughs> sorry, I got kind of lost there. Uh, I will well, say I'm... about the, the Hond version of that. That was sweet enough. I was OK with yeah. that. It yeah, did feel a little work. awkward. It didn't feel like the most effect. If you're going the sacrifice Hanj, it was a little hard to believe that was a sensible decision. Like, is sending one person into the rumbling going to slow it down enough to really make a difference? But I was, I was willing enough to go along with it. Yeah, it still worked in that scene. It worked the best with Erwin when they when he did it the first time, and it also still worked when Isayama did it with Hanji. I did like the cadence of Hanji being in the middle of fighting, suddenly noticing all the dead people around her, and she's like, oh, I guess I already <laughs> I already died. I didn't realize. She was getting yeah. ready to go in for round two until she noticed, oh, hey, my hand floats through my torso. Uh, progressing to the final bit of the climax. As a side note, I do like that Annie is just hanging out with her dad, having yeah. parallel shenanigans. Oh, where An Annie's still around, but she's not part of the final conflict. You know, I can accept mm -hmm. that. She is slightly, slightly part of the fight. Or no, she, no, actually, she, no, actually, she isn't. She isn't. You're right. She before that she is, but uh, for the really final climax, she isn't there. Um, you now Annie's done enough. We couldn't really. It's almost unfair to expect Annie to do anything at this point. Yeah. She helped out a little bit. You know, it's fine as long as it's made canon that she fucks Armin. I can roll with it. <laughs> We don't get even that. We don't get. The I know we that don't, the right? We do get and John and Mikasa, which yeah. uh, is makes fascinating. Sense. Oh, oh, we need to talk about Armin, where Aaron makes the most bizarre. Oh, this is another one. This is another one of the shockingly weird, subversive manga panels in the final scene, <laughs> where Aaron spurs out and just yells about how he doesn't want Mikasa to ever have sex. <laughs> That, in that, his honor. <laughs> that one is no, quite funny. No, I passed up on her on my whole life. I want her to be an old maid who does nothing but fetishize the fact I used to exist, which that, she kind of does yeah. anyway. That scene is at least um, funny and interesting in a way that we finally get to see like the very silly side of Aaron that uh, was gone for so long. <laughs> that uh, we see that, at, in a sense, at heart, that is not gone from Aaron. He's still like this weird little person somewhere. I will. OK, I'll say this. I'm not saying the manga or the world would be improved on the whole by that scene being removed. I am saying it is weird as fuck. Yes, but it, yeah. especially because we have not seen Aaron like this in forever. It's not a normal decision to throw that in at the end. OK, here's this massive saga that starts with primal violence, progresses the conspiracy, ends in racial warfare, complete with Nazi and Jewish iconography all over the goddamn place. And then the very end, the main character is sitting in a giant puddle of piss, screaming that his sister <laughs> can never fuck anyone because he never got to. At least it's water. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Fine. I was I was choosing to interpret it as as mystical desert piss, <laughs> but fine. Okay. I'm gonna not I'm gonna not leave that in because of implications. But what? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um. Okay. Yeah. It's just a bizarre thing because that makes us more sympathetic to Aaron. It does not make us respect him. That's true. In That's the end, true. the saving throw that Isayama throws out for us 
is there is going to be no redemption for Aaron as a character. He's just a spurgy moron, but you can at least feel sorry for him. Yes. Aaron's redemption is that we can pity him. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we get. Although it's nice when they move on, at least other people kind of get good lives a little bit for a while. Yeah, for like 50 years, and we have the, the rise, or well, not rise, I mean, they were pretty uh, fascist and uh, militaristically uh, oriented before that, but uh, they they doubled down on, on the fascism uh, after the, the war. Uh, yeah, but at least at that time, they have peace for maybe 50 years, and then they get completely obliterated. Well, I mean, you know, silver linings. Yeah, there's enough people on the earth at that point where I'm sure they can rebuild and then do it again yeah. in another 50 years and exactly, in another 50 exactly. years and in another least, 50 years. Yeah, it just continues. But yeah, we we see this with the with the boy at the end that not all people there have died. Like there are some survivors somewhere. Yeah, it's uh I don't know what to take from that. It it is a bit sad that Levi's in a wheelchair. <laughs> it's funny because uh, way, way when we started the recording, when I said that I thought uh, we were going to get a protagonist bait and switch, I kind of thought that uh, Aaron would basically become a mentor character for Ben, whoever was going to be the new protagonist, and that he would pretty much be in a wheelchair with uh, one arm less and one leg less. Basically, like, like Levi is at the end. I mean, he has all his limbs, but he's still is sitting in a wheelchair. So that's fun. Uh, you did a lot of speculation in a very short amount of time. I will yes. say that. Yeah. I, it is sad for Levi because Levi's so small. That's why he <laughs> was a badass back in the day. Where if you see a giant buff guy who's old and in a wheelchair, it's, oh, I bet he lost his leg building the Hoover Dam or yeah. some such activity. You see Levi and you go, oh, damn it. He must have been some little sickly kid in the shoe black factory and his yeah. uh, leg fell off. And then he was just in the wheelchair forever. Ah, oh, that's so sad. Every character that's voiced by Hiroshi Kamina is a badass by default. Uh, yep. Who else did he do? Araragi and uh, Uzaya. Oh, wow. Araragi, the greatest badass of all time. He is. <laughs> Re remember in the third arc when he was getting swung around by his fucking intestines? As the yes, cool music and, played. <laughs> and he survived that. <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, in, in some respect, uh, Araragi is quite a badass. Araragi is one you, of those people where he's, he either wins a conflict immediately or he's just a fucking moron who's going to get beaten like a, a redheaded stepchild. Yeah, I'm, I mean less in terms of like his combat power or something like this, but uh, on, a, on a mental level, like uh, his personality. Uh, you have okay. to you have to finish Monogatari at some point because there is especially one one moment at the very end, pretty much of the last season, where uh, that is displayed in some sense. Well, well, fucking Nisio Isin needs to finish Monogatari and admit that it's actually over at some point. It will never be over, but the, the main <laughs> story is over, and the main story is adapted to anime, so that's no. Fun. I, I will always laugh at that, though, where he has Shinobu suck out all his blood. and He's going, OK, I have to get up to full power. You know, I'm not as strong as I was back in the day, but this is me at my ultimate form that I can achieve now. And after all that prep, he just goes and just immediately kicked across the room. Yeah, it's funny every time. And uh, the, the interesting thing in the manga adaptation, um, he's far more competent in, in the fights. That's like one of the interesting things they change about it. They expand on the fights like a whole lot. And they go fucking off the rail with uh, some of the off the rails uh, during some of the later arc stuff. Okay, that, that's funny. I like in Tsubasa Tiger, where he throws the sword down and immediately kills the tiger in one hit. Uh, it's not. It's not. Te it's not. Yeah. Technically, oh, wait, he doesn't kill it, but he paralyzes it. Yeah. Yeah, he, where he just where the sword comes out of nowhere and it goes right through the tiger, and yeah. then the conflict is done. Araragi, he has things he can do, but if if he reaches a situation that it's not in his toolkit, he is fucked. Yeah, in terms of fighting, he's fucked pretty much ninety percent of the time, if not more. Yeah, it's so funny how how underpowered all the characters in Monogatari are. But we can talk about that another day. Hopefully, yeah, never. Yeah. Uh, why never? <laughs> the, why never? I don't. If I don't know if I ever talk talking Monogatari, it's just I don't know. It's just revealing my power level. It's like we're going that, into the depths of otakudom 
Uh, that's I can true. never be a normal person again. Should I reveal what your what your Zoom picture is right now? I won't. <laughs> uh, I think people. I mentioned it in the last one. Oh. Uh, I think I might have actually said it is the thumbnail. I don't know if I did. Uh, ah, I think yeah, you used okay. it for something. Yeah. The point is, though, what we're, what we're even talking about. Oh, yeah, John fucks Mikasa, so that's cool. <laughs> yeah. After being the fucking idiot, it's like, oh, John the horse? Yeah, John the horse cock, motherfuckers. He finally <laughs> wins. He's, if you think about it, um, he most embodies the, the concept of the hero's journey, I think, more so than Eren or any other character. Because he's the unwilling guy who uh, has to step up, basically. Yeah, he's the lazy fuck who just wants to hate his mother and sleep with half Asian women. I mean, I can understand that part. Yeah. It is funny how much of the conflict relies on the fetishism of Asian women within the walls. <laughs> yeah, it's strange. But... Another brilliant meta commentary on the relationship of Japan to the world stage by Isayama. Yes. yes. Yeah, it is funny. It is nice that John gets something. Because yeah, Mar he did it. Well, Marco basically spells it out. In one of the best scenes of the early part of Attack on Titan, Marco says, John, you are not strong. You are weak. Yeah. Aaron is strong. Mikasa is strong. You are weak. But because you overcome your weakness and understand it, that makes you a good leader because you understand people and know how to take care of them. Yeah, it's one of the great scenes of it. Yeah, and then he grows up, and then he gets to have a bunch of quarter Asian babies with Mikasa while she secretly pines for the Hitler archetype who ruined everyone's life. Yeah. Uh, it, it all worked out, kind of. Yeah, for, for those two, at least. In the scope of what this conflict is, that's about as good an ending as you can hope for. Yeah. Like I, like I said earlier, the, some of Aaron's friends get to live out the rest of their lives in relative peace. Yeah. Although, uh, that was Zeke's plan from the beginning. Sterilize everyone. Let him get old, let him die. Yeah, the, the one big flaw with that plan, uh, even if uh, that would have been implemented, it sadly would not uh, prevent an invasion by Mali. That's the one big flaw. There would still have been war and it would not have uh, prevented it. That's the one fuck up that uh, Zeke made. Uh, kind of. I think you could argue that if everyone's in their 50s and sterile, yeah, they're probably going to get beaten up by the Marlins at some point, but are the Marlins... Well, they, they would have like, come before that. Or do you mean like they should have had the rumble and... Uh, oh, <laughs> that was the move. Sterilize everyone and then kill everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, um, uh, because without the rumbling, uh, there will be no 50-year peace time limit. So the Marlins would have come probably over... Not just the Marlins, the rest of the world as well um, would have come over in like maybe two years or something. That's a, yeah, that's a good point. Well, I think we're approaching the end of the conflict. Yep. Uh, I don't know, again, the, the worst part of Attack on Titan's ending is we don't see Armin get with Annie. That's the only problem. Everything else was perfect. It's a 10 out of 10. <laughs> Every frame was a symphony in my imagination. The emotions were so rich and complex. I just need a spinoff where there's one panel confirming that Armin gets with Annie that's all I want. Yes, I agree. I agree with that statement. And talking about the very end, we have to clear this up. How did you feel about the bird? Uh, I've, I said this earlier as well. I think it's I'm sure corny. You it's corny and it doesn't exactly work. I get the sentiment. But it, it once again, it's so not grounded in the reality. Like the bird actually wraps, uh, wraps the uh, scarf around Mikasa like Aaron did. And <laughs> that's, that makes no fucking sense, but uh, I get what it was meant to do. But I don't like it. The bird is implied to be Aaron, right? Yes. He's a seagull? I think it is, yes. You can't at least be a hawk or an albatross. You have to be a seagull. Uh, in, in another scene, like... Uh, <sighs> There is this weird little uh, make pretend uh, mind memory thing of Mikasa where she imagines herself and Eren like uh, somewhere in the fucking woods uh, having run away together. And there is a scene. That scene ends with Eren staring up at a hawk, not at a seagull. So that's strange. It's just fucking weird. It, it was just awkward and inappropriate. Not bad, but inappropriate for what was happening around it yes 
It actually reminds me of, have you ever read Gantz or know anything about Gantz? Yes, I uh, read the entire manga. Okay, you seem like a Gantz guy. You know <laughs> that the guy who writes Gantz, who I, to my core, believe is literally autistic. Not in the I've, meme way. Like, this man actually has autism spectrum disorder. He might. Uh, or he's insane. One of, one of the two things. There is very little difference between autism and insanity. Just ask Aaron. But, okay. but the Gantz guy is a master of writing emotional moments in a context where nothing around them makes sense, where he can create compelling images and story beats, but he doesn't understand the connective tissue between them that turns into something coherent. Yeah. The best example of this is there's a scene in Gantz where in order to cause an incident, one of the Gantz fighter people paints his skin black, gets two fucking micro Uzis, one for each hand, starts walking down a city block, massacring civilians. Like he's just waving both his arms wildly in random directions, shooting hundreds of bullets every five seconds, mowing down a crowd of random people in Japan. And he's just slowly progressing through it. And his reasons are never really... I don't even remember why he was doing this. He's just I don't, a serial even... killer who was trying to cause panic. That is a testament to how weird the Gantz guy is that you don't remember this. Because it's not yeah. even the weirdest scene in Gantz. It's, it's just it's the not, funniest. It's not by far not the weirdest scene that happens. No, but he's... Fun no, we haven't even... Oh, this guy's best friends with the panda bear who also joins in the alien hunting expeditions, if that oh, makes okay, sense. Oh, okay, okay. Um... But this fucking guy is committing a mass act of random violence. He's already killed like 300 people. And then the main character's girlfriend, who happens to be in the area, is running from the bullets, sees a stroller with a single baby in it, and she has the moment of, oh, I have to save this baby. And she swaddles the baby and is running through the bullets and running away. And the Gantz guy doesn't process, you know, yeah, saving the baby is a compelling little emotional moment that gets us invested in this character and the conflict i get that don't you think it's a little tone deaf to have this moment of innocent desire to help people in the middle of this insane bloodbath where a man in blackface is shooting thousands of civilians <laughs> every 10 seconds <sighs> like we're gonna save one baby in the mountain of bodies you have created we're going to have one scene of the main character being a seagull after he's killed 80% of the world population. And we're supposed yeah. to go, oh, that's cute that he got to be a bird at the end after he, you know, gassed every racial minority on the planet. Good for him. Yeah. yeah. And continuing the theme of the end of Attack on Titan producing bafflingly bad panels, the incel bird staring through the window is one of the funniest images in manga. <laughs> Shit, uh, where, where's that? Like, um... The very end, where there's just... You just see a seagull staring in the window at John and Mikasa. The implication, I think, being that Aaron just watched them fuck, and he's just going to fly <laughs> away now. Why, why do... I am... Are you sure that... The context might be slightly off. I will delete this if I'm wrong. But okay. people memed the fuck out of this image of bird I've... Aaron just staring through a window. Shit, I'm not sure if I remember this correctly. And there were a bunch of photo there were a bunch of photoshops of Aaron's man bun on the bird's head. Oh, 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 yeah, right. I remember that image, but uh, the context is a little bit more. I think I might have dropped a photo out of it, edit of it, on Twitter once, and you looked at it. Might be. Yeah, I've seen that that photoshopped image definitely. We're pretty far in. Yeah. Pretty pretty tired. Any thoughts? that you want to share anything we missed anything specific really quick i'll say part of the problem with attack on titan is it had issues maintaining a cohesive narrative and it eventually collapsed under the weight of the story it crafted to support all the little parts yeah but it's a testament to attack on titan there were very good elements in the story that came and went so often that some of them we just never brought up we didn't talk about kenny for example and oh, Kenny's shit. arc was yes. a great little thing. It yeah. was maybe not much to talk about, but he was an entertaining character. The yeah, merchant actually, guy's son. They had the whole Kenny-related arc of getting the merchant's son to back the survey corpse and help them reclaim the kingdom. Yeah. Another great little character. There were a lot of people who just came and went in Attack on Titan, had great moments, disappeared, and I didn't give Isayama enough credit for those. Yeah, Kenny, because there Kenny were a lot is of fucking awesome as a character. 
like his introduction scene and the ensuing pursuit of Levi is probably one of my favorite animated scenes of all time. It's just so fucking awesome. On that note, I always found it funny that once the Eldians and Marlians are fighting each other, the technological progress of the Marlians over the Eldians is the whole impetus for the conflict. Yeah. But it's fucking hilarious that because of the Titan fighting, the Eldians have the Survey Corps and they have a class of people that can use 3D maneuvering gear in cities. It's hilarious that their technological backwardsness led to them developing a special type of elite troop that no rational person would ever create. Yes, and what's also weird is that they did not adapt their, their blade design. They still used the blade design to fight titans instead of optimizing them to fight humans. <laughs> Which, I mean, if you already have them. Yeah, but they should not work as well as like a regular type of cleaver thing that's optimized for high-speed um, slashing, like a saber or something. I just found it hilarious because it's such a stupid problem to have. The enemy troops are swinging above our heads like Spider-Man, too fast for us to see them, and they're cutting us up with giant box cutters. Okay, but at this point, they also have like uh, semi-automatic uh, pistols and uh, bolt-action rifles. Yep, Sasha gets shot with one. Yes. That's what they should have done. They should have had Gabby get a Survey Corp sword and slowly plunge it into Sasha's heart while everyone watched. Uh, it's like in the end of private her saving private ryan um, yeah just like that oh uh, that scene is hard to watch yeah i, I bet <laughs> okay. have you seen it <laughs> i i know i haven't seen the movie i've i've seen the scene i know the scene okay yeah because it gets referenced a lot really <sighs> yeah. like who references this and for what reason i don't know i forget Yep, I'm getting a little tired. Yeah, well, it's, Jaws, uh, it's okay. we're, re we're, we're reaching the end of Attack yeah, on yep. Titan, as is the title of the podcast, I assume. Any thoughts you want to tie up? Any beliefs? Any characters you like that you want to give a last-minute shout-out before we quit? No, not really. I think I'm done with the most important stuff. I think that's it, too. So, yeah, I don't have anything funny to say. <laughs> Do you like oh, wait, oh, wait, I had... Oh, sorry, go. Uh, do you like your can of worms uh, steered or shaken? Shaken. <laughs> Rumbled! <laughs> Rumbled. Uh, I'm a genius. I'm so cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and this is a totally irrelevant observation. You know how you said that it is implied that if you flip the Earth upside down, the Eldian continent is supposed to be Madagascar? Yeah. Very, very weird connection but are you aware of the Madagascar plan? I've heard about this, yeah. We don't know how serious it was, but at one point the Nazi leadership was playing with the idea of taking every Jew in the world and dumping them on Madagascar. Yeah, I heard about this. It's strange that... I mean, maybe it's not strange. Maybe Isayama uh, knew about this and made it exactly for that reason. He placed there. The hilarious thing about Isayama is that he took... He took a big glob of inter-ethnic and racial conflict, dumped the symbolism around almost randomly in a way where it was guaranteed to piss a lot of people off. Yes. <laughs> like, there's basically no way this could have gone uh, in any way without pissing off a lot of people. If you read Attack on Titan in the most cursory way, you can almost see it as, oh, it's World War II, but the Jews totally did it. <laughs> ah, that, but that's such a strange view on it but nah yeah where then you realize oh well it's not like the jews are actually evil but then they go in and go oh no no you see the jews aren't evil personally but there's this ancient blood curse against them that dooms us the fight that's so weird right like two thousand years ago who would have known i'm pro i mean i'm jaws i'm probably gonna cut this part out i'm just that's just a thing yeah. I noticed. Okay, yeah, but uh, yeah, you're right about that. Like, there, there's, some, there's some dark implications in there, maybe. Yeah, I mean, people complain about this. Like, there, there are many people who, uh, yeah, criticize this about the Attack on Titan. Pixis looks like the admiral who desecrated Korea during Japanese colonialism. Right, yeah, I forgot about that. And the author just admitted it. He said, oh, yeah, he was based on him. <sighs> it's like, Isayama, you don't think that might be a bad idea? Uh, 
depends on how it how how it worked out for him. Yeah. No, uh, I mean Pixis is cool, so that makes it worth yeah, it. Yeah, the, the character pro- itself, pro- it's cool. It's cool. I probably am gonna take this off. Well, Jaws, if you have nothing else to say, I don't think I do either. All right. You know, Attack on Titan, it was flawed. It did some things really well. I yeah. do appreciate it because it was one of those companion pieces that was always around. Yeah. And I, I will I, I will I do have affection for that. In general, I still really, really like this. And uh, I think uh, in the anime, the Shigan Shina uh, part, like uh, um, part two of season three is like a 10 out of 10 for every single episode. And I uh, still really, really like Attack on Titan. Well, I I will corroborate that, sir. You know, for all its flaws, the the world is a brighter place for Attack on Titan having been written. And now that Isayama can actually draw, you know, his next story might be better. Yeah, it's going to be about giant titan asses, female titan asses, I guess. <clears throat> we can only hope. <laughs>